Good evening and welcome to the Monday, May 14th, 2018 meeting of the Town Council, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. May we please pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the town clerk please take the roll call? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councillor Garvin? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor Randall? Here. And Councillor Straw? Here. Thank you. Um, are there any town council reports and correspondence? Anything that anyone needs to share? Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes, I'd like to just update people on uh, the work of the comprehensive plan. And there's going to be another uh, public forum on June 6th. And so um, the uh, outline of that should be posted probably after our next meeting, which is the 17th of May. And uh, also encourage people to again participate in the Lumio. And this, uh, the question that should be coming forward at this point in time is about uh, support for um, uh, farms and agriculture in um, Cape Elizabeth. So, thank you. Is there anyone else? I just have two things. Uh, we've received many emails. Um, from uh, citizens in favor of passing the school budget. We've some, received some that were not in favor of passing the school budget, but we have received two in writing. And that's why I wanted to highlight these because uh, all of the other emails to the council are, dis are discoverable and can be seen by any citizen. But we've gotten two that were just printed in letters from Mr. Glenn Cummings. So I just wanted to, I'm sorry, Gary Cummings. So I just wanted to just notify the public that we'd received two from Mr. Gary, Cum Mr. Gary Cummings. Yes, so Councilor Straw? I think I only have one, or is this two combined? No, there was, a, there was an earlier one. Uh, less. Uh, there was one that we was on our, it was, uh, put on these, um, on our desks, I think April 30th. And oh, we so received. a different meeting. Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yep. And, um, but it was after our formal meeting, and so we just got this one, and so I'm mentioning both of these. The actual, the other one that we received, I think on the 30th of May, had no date on it. Mr. Cummings had not put a date on that letter, but this one has uh, May 12th. So anyway, we have those at the public, wherever want to see them. The town clerk, I'm giving my copies to the town clerk. That's all. Anyone else? Okay, um, the next uh, uh, item on our agenda is actually a review and discussion of the fiscal year 2017 audits. We had invited um, the auditors from Runyon, Kirsten, and Willette to meet with us on April 9, at our April 9 meeting. However, Jennifer was unavailable due to the flu, so she's here, here tonight. And um, just, um, and the, the reason that she is here is that because of our municipal audit results, it's incumbent upon us to, to ask our auditors questions for the public's benefit at a, at a monthly town meeting. And so that's why she's here. And um, for the first time in history, we had two significant deficiencies on our, on our municipal audit report. We've had um, a joint meeting, board meeting with the school department on January 8th. And we had another one on March 14. Um, however, um, we'd like to um, let the public know what corrective steps are being taken. Um, and uh, so we'll ask questions of, of Jennifer if counselors have any questions. I've also asked for essentially a pre-audit to take place because I certainly don't want the town to receive such a report again. And so not wanting to wait until the next audit cycle, I've asked for a pre-audit review, which I believe you're starting tomorrow. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'll just turn this over to the town manager and to any other counselors who have questions for Jennifer or comments, rather. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Jen, how are, how are you? Glad to see you this week. Good, how are you? <laughs> yeah, much better. <laughs> uh, if, if you could, if you may just want to bring the council up to speed as to some of the steps that we've taken over the past few months uh, in response to that, uh, the most recent audit. And then also, if you could uh, talk about what the pre-audit 
uh, steps take place that, that we'll be beginning to, tomorrow, if you could, please. Sure. Um, so the steps related specifically to the significant deficiencies, um, first of all, the comment related to the year-end reports. Um, one of the things we did is um, we talked about the timing of the audit. Traditionally, the audit takes place the second or third week in July. And we decided it might be beneficial if the staff has a little more time to prepare for the audit. So we've actually pushed the audit back to the week of August 7th, 27th. Excuse me. So that will give the staff an opportunity to review the reports, make sure they're in balance, to post any adjusting journal entries they need to post, and also to identify any other issues that might possibly come up. The other thing that we've done, we've talked with the business manager and there is an employee who is currently reviewing the monthly reports and ensuring that they are in balance. And as far as I know, the only issues so far have been just timing issues, which is mainly a difference of when the reports are run and when adjusting journal entries are posted. They're sometimes posted in the next month. So the other issue related to the reports had to do with uh, year-end adjustments and the town uses what's called a period 13 to post those adjustments. Now they're only 12 months or 12 periods in a year, but sometimes some municipalities will use an additional period to post journal entries back to the fiscal year. The accounting software is currently not set up to automatically post to the interfund receivables and payables. And what happens is when journal entries are posted, those journal entries throw the individual funds out of balance. I talked to the business manager about those entries and they will be doing manual adjustments at year end to get those funds into balance. That is one of those areas that we will have to address when we come for the audit itself because we will have to wait until after the books are closed. But during the pre-audit, we will be running reports and looking at the individual funds to make sure that they are in balance and to also see if there are any other issues that might pop up. Okay. Any questions related to the year-end reports? Questions? No. Oh, Councilor Straw? Sure. Um, so I've got a variety of questions, um, not necessarily directly related solely to the year-end reports, but I'll try to keep this question just with the year-end reports. Um, so my understanding is basically one of the two significant deficiencies had to relate specifically to the year-end reports. Mm -hmm. So um, my understanding is basically our fiscal year ends June 30th, is that correct? Correct. And your audit was beginning less than 30 days after the end of our fiscal year. Is that correct. correct? So in some instances, basically for reasons that I still escape me, this, the town, and we've been doing this, my understanding is, for a very, very long time, has chosen to schedule its audit before the staff has an opportunity to actually close out all the books, receive all of the bank statements, everything else. Is that an accurate um, characterization of the situation? That is correct. Right. Um, it, it, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so we, we've now addressed that by now moving the audit back. This is something we could have done in the past, but for whatever reason, the town council has chosen not to. But we've now addressed that by moving it back so that at least those discrepancies will hopefully be dealt with because it will give the staff an opportunity to close out the books for the year. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, so with respect to the... Uh, the characterization that this is the first time we've had two significant deficiencies. This issue with the year-end reports, although it's never been classified as a significant deficiency in the past, it has occurred in the past. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So, uh, oh. sorry. Uh, so it has occurred in the past. The only thing that has changed is that it was characterized as a significant deficiency this time around. That is correct. Um, the we did have the same issue in 2016. Um, however, that year the business manager was new. Um, she wasn't as familiar with the accounting software, so we wrote it up as sort of an other comment um, and discussed it with her, hoping that it would be addressed in 2017. What, during that year, was it raised to the school board or the town council as part of the yearly audit review? I believe we discussed it in 2016. Okay. Uh, did the finance chair take any steps to rectify the problem when that was raised that you're aware of? In 2016? Correct. I don't believe so because we right. were Thank basically you. giving the, the staff time to sort of catch up and address that themselves. Right. Okay. 
Anyone else? Uh, the, the other significant deficiency had to do with capital assets and how the town is identifying its additions and also tracking its capital projects. Um, so I understand that the, the business manager is working with the new facilities manager to better track uh, individual capital projects. One of the issues that came up is there were actually several school department projects that were being reported within the same expenditure lines. So it became very difficult to figure out which expenditures were related to which projects. The um, business manager has also sent me the fixed asset policy to verify the cap capitalization thresholds. Uh, we've also talked about uh, how to determine what should be capitalized and I also sent her a spreadsheet so that she could better track projects that are currently in progress. Uh, so we will be reviewing that spreadsheet during interim and, and make sure that they're doing everything that they, they need to do to identify those capital asset additions. Okay. Councilor Straw? A couple more questions on this one. Uh, so again, we've been following the same asset tracking policy for a number of years, is that correct? I believe so, yes. Right. Um, and so the issue with the significant deficiencies, um, some have characterized this as commingling of funds. Do you believe that's an accurate uh, term to describe what occurred? No, it, there was no commingling of funds so much as the school department projects were sort of commingled within the same expenditure lines. However, they were all school department projects and they were all funded through bonds. So characterizing this as commingling of funds would not be an accurate term in this situation? I would not use that term, no. Thank you. You would, however, say there was a commingling of assets, accounting asset lines. Is that is correct. Yeah, Thank capital you. project lines. Thank you. Another follow-up question. Uh, if uh, to, fair enough, if you were to consider it as commingling of assets, basically it was. Uh, is it fair to say that um, I'll use shingles as an example? Uh, there was a there were a number of roofing projects that occurred. A pile of shingles was purchased, and the issue was that the shingles were not broken out into the specific roof uh, asset that they were used on. Instead, it was, we bought a pile of shingles. Is that, that an accurate description of what happened? That was, that was part of the issue. Uh, there were several projects um, related to various renovations. Some were roof projects, some were other renovations, such as a locker room, those types of things. It, and is it fair to say, um, and I apologize to the general public, we, didn't video, we, the town council, did not videotape this discussion that we already had in the past. Is it fair to say that we touched on almost all of this at the prior workshops? That is correct. Thank you. Yep. Anything else, Councilor Straw? Anyone else? Councilor Randall? Just to follow up on um, Councillor Straw's questions and points, I think there are a number of people who may be um, unclear on what exactly the issue was with the, um, as, as it's been described, commingling of lines. Could you just put into layman's terms what the issue was for um, the purposes of everyone understanding that? Sure. Um, I will try to. <laughs> um, I know it's a so there were easy. there were basically two issues related to capital assets. Um, one has to do with how the capital projects are actually recorded in the accounting software. Typically, you have different expenditure lines set up or different divisions set up to track different projects. The issue was that there were several projects that were accounted for within one expenditure line. So what happened is you had to actually go through the detail of that expenditure line and figure out which expenditures were related to each project. Um, I'm not sure if that clearly explains it. Uh, the other issue had to do with actually identifying asset additions. Um, typically the, the town has a spreadsheet that it tracks all of its capital assets or fixed assets on. Uh, they are supposed to identify current year additions and, and disposals and then provide that information to us. However, in 2017, there were approximately $4 million in capital asset additions that were not identified and added to that spreadsheet. Uh, those were assets that we identified as part of the audit process. And, and that's when you referred to the spreadsheet that you had provided to the business manager. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, no, that was an additional spreadsheet that we put together to help her better track um, 
the projects that are currently in progress but have not been I not have been have not been added to the capital asset spreadsheet yet. Um, the capital asset spreadsheet is really used for projects that have been completed, uh, whereas a construction in progress spreadsheet would be an ongoing project that overlaps fiscal years and has not yet been completed. Anyone else? Councilor Straw? Uh, so, um, just to put all of this into context, um, obviously the way that the, everything is being tracked in um, um, followed up with uh, with respect to our books is not necessarily how an Intel or an Apple or an IBM or a G or HP would do this. Um, but how does it compare to other towns in Maine that you have experience with? As far as tracking their capital assets? Correct. There are a lot of municipalities that use spreadsheets Thank to you. Uh, identify and track their capital assets. A few do use special modules uh, for their accounting software, but they are few and far between. Council Lennon? So with apologies because I missed that workshop, what I'm gathering here is this problem was not so much a large problem of misunderstanding or misuse of funds, but rather some small clerical confusion or oversight or maybe even deadline issues. Uh, well, part of it had to do with turnover uh, with the facilities manager. Uh, the previous manager left and then there was a, a gap and, and um, uh, a misunderstanding as to how those projects should be tracked and accounted for. Uh, some of it was that um, just not being aware that that spreadsheet needed to be updated as much as it, as it did. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Councilor Garvin? Um, one of the things we talked about in our workshop um, was the timeliness of raising concerns on the part of the business manager um, if, rather than waiting till the audit to say, hey, I have this problem, but sort of more in the course of business reach out. Have you had um, uh, any contact from the business manager raising any concern to raise red flags during this current period? I have not, not, not red flags, more just uh, checking in with me and verifying uh, how they should be doing things to make sure that they are addressing uh, the issues from the audit. I have and, another question too. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if yours is related to that, then go ahead because it's a different topic, so. Um, well, I, I was just gonna ask about, uh, I think it was the period 13 and the uh, concerns that we'd had a, a software update, which of course, those are fairly standard with software and there's always an adjustment period, but I think one of the issues that I recall was that there was, there was a problem noted, but nothing was done about it. And the, and, and, and the thought was, we'll wait till the audit, auditors come and they'll help us sort it out. And wasn't that a factor in some of the issues that we had to deal with in our report? That was. Okay, thank you. Yep, go um, ahead. Another, another question I had, we had talked about um, when you and your colleague and Matt and Jessica and I met um, separately um, about the notion of a potential finance director position. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you advised us on was that um, Cape Elizabeth is actually quite an outlier in terms of the communities in the region and certainly clients that you work with in not having a finance director, is that correct? Yes. Could you just expand upon that a little bit and explain, um, again, more for the public's benefit of what that role would look like and why many other towns and cities have those? Sure. Um, yeah, mo most setups that we see in municipalities that have both the town and or city and school side, they do have separate finance functions. So typically the school department does have a business manager who oversees the finances of the school department. And then the town has a finance director who oversees the finances of the entire town, which would also incorporate the school department. Um, that person would um, typically be the liaison between the council, the town manager, and the auditors. Um, and they would uh, typically be responsible for the financial reporting for the entire town. 
And so for a town with the total budget that we have, it's unusual to not have somebody in that role? You'd say? Correct. Great, mm -hmm. thanks. And just for the public's benefit, this, the potential of this position has come up, and so the plan for the council is to begin some discussion about that as we proceed in our year, to, to look at the possibility of that particular position. And thanks, Councilor Garvin, for asking about that. Anything else for, uh, for Jennifer? Yep. yep. Just had a couple Matt. of quick items that I wanted to... Uh, yeah, I, th I think the whole process has been very productive working with, you know, with the town council as well as with the school board and the, and the business manager and the superintendent uh, to get to this point. Uh, there are some good things that have taken place. I think part of it is, uh, you know, starting the pre-audit early, about a month earlier than we have uh, traditionally and then taking the audit out a month later than we have traditionally as well. Uh, so I think that's going to be beneficial in this year's process. The, uh, the other thing that we're also looking at this year because the fiscal year ends on, uh, well, the, tw the 29th of June is a Friday, and that poses a significant challenge to our uh, finance staff. So what we are, we've been discussing internally is possibly closing at noon on the 29th of June to uh, allow them to close their books. So, uh, because Monday, everything starts anew, uh, you know, with July 2nd being there, and it's the 4th of July week, and people will be registering boats and cars, and all that that takes place at the beginning of the of the year. So that's the start. Of, that's the end and the start of our fiscal year with well, the Friday and a Monday. So uh, we will uh, be reporting on back on that next month at the council meeting. But uh, but that is an additional thing that we are looking at to make sure that staff doesn't feel harried or try to have to rush through the, the end of the year closing of the books, which is a uh, uh, quite a task. But uh, but thank you for letting me just report on that. All right. We certainly look forward to a no deficiencies report on our next municipal audit. That's, that's the goal of Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jennifer. And could we now have the Finance Committee report, please? Um, so, obviously, tonight uh, we'll be voting on um, the municipal and school budget um, items, so that's the uh, primary thing to update from the Finance Committee. Um, everybody received the distribution of the uh, dashboard earlier today. Um, as I discussed with Matt, nothing that leapt out at me, uh, you know, comparative to month over month. But Matt, if there's anything you want to particularly highlight or touch on, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Councilor Garvin. I'd be ha I'd be happy to. Uh, there are two items that, uh, well, actually, there's a number of items out there uh, that everybody would p please uh, feel free to to read them on the website. We do have them. You'll notice again our building permits uh, our amounts are tracking. Uh, still quite robustly uh, due to the due to the strong building economy. Uh, we're doing extremely well there uh, this year, as well as on our uh, excise taxes still continue to track at a greater rate than last year. So those are two positive results on our uh, revenue side. Two areas on the expense side that I have concerns and I'll be coming back with uh, recommendations next month for, for uh, to rectify these situations is our legal services amount. We are, uh, we're above where we need to be on that for the year, as well as on our uh, vehicle maintenance amount. But the vehicle maintenance line itself uh, will balance out through the department's, the departmental budget uh, short uh, or underspends on other parts of the budget. But the legal side, right, we'll have to come back to the council with a recommendation to, to close that gap to get us through the end of the fiscal year. Uh, that's due to some, obviously some unforeseen legal expenses that the town has incurred and, and will be incurring uh, till the end of the fiscal year. So. Uh, but otherwise, we are uh, in very good financial shape and uh, looking better by the by the by the day. So uh, we're on positive positive ground for sure. Thank you. Yep. Thank any you. Any questions for Matt? I don't have any. any questions for me? Thank you. No. Nope. Thank you. And <clears throat> our other reports. Anything on the appropriation control port report? Expense distribution. Revenue control or revenue distribution? Any questions for the town manager on any of those? No. Nope. All right. Our next uh, item is the opportunity for citizens to address the town council uh, on items not on tonight's agenda. That is an I anything not on tonight's agenda. If you would like to step up and, and address the council, you have three minutes to do so. And we need your name and address, please. Well, seeing no one, we'll move on. Could we now have the town manager's monthly report? 
Do we have it to you, Madam Chair? Thank you very much. Uh, in light of this evening's lengthy agenda, I will <laughs> attempt to try to keep uh, this, my manager's report fairly brief. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the Cape Elizabeth Police Department who held a drug take back day on April 28th where unused and unwanted medications were collected to be disposed of properly. This is always a very successful event which resulted in 194 and a half pounds of unwanted medications being brought in for proper disposal. Uh, so that means when, when I say proper disposal, they'll, you know, this company takes care of this appropriately and, and instead of just, you know, quite frankly, don't flush them down uh, the drain or, or just throw them in the trash to be incinerated. If you do have them, uh, this would be the opportunity to do that once a year. So, uh, But it is a very successful program. And across the state, uh, it's, it's extremely successful. On the public works side, uh, the public works crews have been extremely busy with street sweeping. If they haven't been down your street yet, the street yet, please be patient. They are on their way. Uh, but they are still addressing the multiple issues after this recent winter uh, for our spring cleanup. Uh, great news, a, a fairly large project that we have funded in this current year's budget is the CSO, the Combined Stormwater Overflow Project, uh, to el eliminate the illicit connections to the storm sewer has been extremely successful. This has come partly due to our, our, our staff efforts as well as uh, the, the citizens' efforts who are the uh, illicit connections uh, connectors. Uh, working together, they have resulted in the, in the corrections of 37 illicit connections being properly connected and the project will com be completed this week, which is great. Uh, uh, we've really nailed that one right on schedule. If you have visited Fort Williams Park recently, you'll notice that there are now pedestrian improvements at the picnic shelter parking lot. And they are complete and they look great. And the retaining wall on the battery is also progressing and should be wrapping up shortly. This past Saturday, 400 vehicles came to participate in the Household Hazardous Waste event at the Recycling Center. This is also very popular and provides the opportunity to dispose of unwanted materials that are generally very difficult to dispose of. And uh, that, that is another huge event. And then finally, we arrive at the end of the budget process. I'd like to take the opportunity to express my gratitude to all of my department heads and the town's department heads for helping in the crafting of the town budget. The town is blessed with some of the best department heads in the state and their work is reflected in this year's town budget. And I just want to express my gratitude for all their hard work. And that's all I have to report on this evening. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments about the town manager's report? Okay, the next item, a review of the draft minutes of April 9, 2018. And special meetings uh, minutes held, uh, a special uh, minutes of the special meeting held on May 1st and May 7th. So first, could I have a motion to approve the draft minutes of April 9, 2018? I move that we uh, adopt the, or that, apologize. I move that we approve the draft minutes of April 9th, 2018, subject to the following modifications. Uh, number one, on page two, uh, the citizen opportunity for discussion of items on the agenda. Uh, strike everything after April 8th um, under Ms. Violetti's uh, comments. Number two, with respect to Ms. Patterson's comments, strike uh, everything from thank you on to the end of her comments, replacing instead with the following insertion. She feels the tone of the memo was harsh and somewhat insulting, aggressive, and accusatory. And then finally, number three is I would strike in, in its entirety the attachment of Ms. Velotti's letter that was stuck to the end of our minutes. Second. Is there any discussion? I'm trying to actually, I don't have a... I just second it just to move it along, but... Can you slow down what you just Sure, there? sure. I'll start from the top. <laughs> page two. Um, now wait for us to get to page two. Please. All right, all right, fair enough. So, okay, page two, April 9. Yep. Correct. You're talking about? Uh, citizen opportunities for discussion of items not on the agenda. There are three items. The first one um, is a misquote. Um, that phrase does not actually appear in the public record at all. I watched the video. Um, rather than quibble over words, I would just put a period after April 8th and strike the rest. 
Uh, number one, or the number two, Ms. Patterson, um, I think this is a mischaracterization of her comments. Her comments were not a thank you to Ms. Violetti with respect to her research. Instead, she said something along the lines of the tone of the memo was harsh and somewhat insulting, aggressive, and accusatory. I think that's a much more accurate characterization of what she actually said. And then finally, um, we've received a large number of letters from residents uh, with respect to the school budget and uh, issues relating to the school. I think it is inappropriate for us to add a particular memorandum to the end of our meeting minutes, especially when this memorandum was not part of our meeting. It was not read into the notes. Um, I'm a little curious how it got on here. Um, and unless we're gonna be sticking everyone's letters at the end of our meeting minutes, I don't believe it belongs attached to the end of our minutes. Councilor Randall? I just have a question. Um, how are things typically handled like this when a memo or, because we did get a, get a written letter which um, you acknowledged. How do we typically deal with these kinds of things? Which, the, the letter that we received from the citizen, you mean? Memos or thing, things of that nature that are provided to the council, are they, are they usually included in the minutes? Um, the, in this case, the, when the citizen presented, <laughs> sent, sent her memo to everyone, the council and the school board presented it at the meeting. Um, you know, it was felt that, that as she presented it and we'd all received it, that we would include it in the minutes as part of the public record. Councilor Straw? I'd like to ask a question of the town clerk by way of the town chair. Uh, uh, town, uh, Deb, I think you do a fabulous job. Uh, could you give us some background on how the letter came to be attached to the minutes? Um, I was following up on uh, some discussions that I'd heard and also um, an email that Councilor Garvin had to a citizen referencing a suggestion that the meeting minutes are compiled and that we consider linking those documents for public access and eve of reference and archival. I was anticipating that it was gonna be requested tonight um, by this um, email from a counselor to a resident. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add to that. So um, I, I think the council remembers there was some discussion about um, obviously once the memo and the materials were sent to us, they became a matter of public record. Um, in the interest of um, making them easily accessible for future archival purposes so that if somebody was reading the minutes and said, what the heck was that about? I have no idea what that's about. Simply, if you, if you go on to the meeting materials, you'd find it easily. Um, so it had less to do with, in my opinion, representing what took place or may or may not have been read into the record at the meeting so much as it was for ease of access and um, cross-tabbing, if you will, down the line. Okay. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Well, so just to kind of get back to Valerie's question, which I don't think was answered at all, um, what typically has happened, because I've been on the council a while and I don't remember seeing in minutes a lot of attached documents. I know things are put into the supporting documents and that's where they stay, but I don't remember seeing a lot of letters being attached to our minutes. So I'm just curious, have I missed things over the last years or is this just something new? If, if I may, Madam okay. Chair. Uh, Council Jordan, I'd say we're in somewhat uncharted waters, uh, to be honest. I, and I know if, if Deb can help me on this as well, I think that would be a comparable answer. I think uh, Councilor Garvin's idea and explanation was consistent with what we were thinking, but generally, the council rarely, if ever, receives that type of document. document. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's extremely rare. So that's it, as he said, it's a it's an opportunity to have that reference point there, and it's a question of trying to find where to par properly house it. Uh, if there's a recommendation on where the council would like me to house something along those lines, or have that you know maintained, we'd be happy to to take uh, suggestions for sure on that. Councilor, I think Lennon, or was, Councilor Garvin was, I was next. Saying, I mean, it could just as easily be linked as a supporting document. It doesn't have to be, I, I mm -hmm. that was probably the intent of what I meant and not even, I, I probably was too specific in the request or the direction to append it to the minutes. Um, 
all I meant was this was a point of discussion at that meeting for somebody that would then be going back to try and dig up the information for future reference. It would just make sense to have it easily accessible there. That's all. Yep. It's completely immaterial to me whether it's a part of the minutes or not. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lennon. I just might make a general comment. This is my ninth year on the town council, and I have never in all my years have a recollection of any citizen email getting anywhere close to this amount of coverage, oxygen, posting, staff time, re-emails, publicly posted on our website. It's been attached to innumerable documents, minutes, and agendas. I'm totally baffled why this continues to haunt us, particularly because it's not even about the town council, it's about the school board. I personally find it completely inappropriate. That's just my personal opinion. Anyone else? Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Um, I'm not sure moving forward. The other suggestions you mentioned, I am not knowledgeable enough as he is on um, reclassifying, striking, and, and putting different things in. So I don't know if we can separate that from the attachment, because I also believe, I, when I read Jamie's, I thought it was that it was going to become a supporting document. I think we're going to start a whole new slippery slope if we decide what gets attached to meeting minutes and what doesn't get attached. And I honestly think before we go so far as attaching it to meeting minutes, we are going to want to have that joint workshop with the school board to discuss this document before we immoralize it. I'm pretty sure I pronounced that wrong in our minutes. Thank you. Anyone else? I would say, um, I think you're, you're actually right, correct, Sarah Lennon, Councilor, Councilor Lennon, in your thoughts. I, I, I think we could, certainly could go back and pull it out, having myself been on the council for nine, nine consecutive years, that there have been occasions in the past that we have received documents. I'm thinking way back when with the gun club, some things like that that we actually did include. We could certainly do a history search on that. Um, and this may be a policy question to go forward with, but I think, you know, Councilor Garvin's intent um, and spirit was in full transparency. Transparency, and that's what we are, and frankly, should be all about. So, whether you know a memorandum of some kind that is attached one way or the other, we can certainly go forward with a policy discussion on that as to maybe some more concrete approach if that's what the council wants. I, personally, I'm not sure it's necessary. What I think is critical is that when something comes forward and we look at it, that it is, it is available to the public, so they know, in fact, what we are discussing, whether everyone feels it's, they can support it or it's valid or it's invalid or whatever. The point is that we promote transparency. Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, just a couple of things and um, number one, I agree with uh, Caitlin that if, uh, if this is going to be where we head in the future that we do need to at the workshop say, where will we insert these links? Because I also agree with um, Councillor Garvin that it sometimes is more um, forward thinking to uh, embed a link than to make people dig for data. Mm -hmm. And so if, um, if we really want to head in this direction, which I think it is, it's, it's a pretty good direction to think about when you consider the technology we have at our fingertips. How can we make it easy for people to get to historical um, information? So I think Caitlin's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor Garvin. Um, Last point on this for me. So I just remembering back to the sequence on this, I'm looking at my email now. We received, I don't know, if, I can't remember if we all received or if it was just I that received an email after the meeting from a citizen who was here, attended the meeting and had a couple of questions about the material. And because the material that was referenced was not part of our agenda or our packet, she says, I went on to the website, clicked on public issues correspondence, thinking I could find such information, so on and so forth. So it was in response specifically to a citizen inquiry saying, hey, what was that that was being talked about? Right. So that's, what, that's the history on all this. Well, we could certainly, thank you, we could certainly, you know, put that on an agenda for an upcoming workshop to do a little deeper dive on, on process with this sort of thing. Would it, Council okay with that? And as far as the other, uh, if, 
with uh, the council's uh, agreement, um, I think we could turn to the other comments Council Straw made about the, the, the synopsis of comments. Go ahead. If, if I may, just for ease of moving the evening along, I would simply strike every, I, instead of altering Ms. Patterson's to, uh, uh, summary to match what I think was more accurate, um, I would simply strike everything. Um, from April 8th, I'd put a period and I'd strike the remainder with Ms. Valetti's uh, comments. And then for Ms. Patterson's, I would strike thank you to Janet um, and everything else to the end. Well, uh, any thoughts on that? I, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I agree with you. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not sure actually how to proceed. I mean, I think, I think you bring up some good points. I, I certainly recall the vast majority of this being said, and there were certainly other things that are not here that were said. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure how to proceed, and I'm not sure I could agree to strike everything because. If that were the case, then we should re be striking everything this uh, a teacher spoke about. I mean, I, I, you know, my, my point being that if you start essentially censoring things, then you've got to censor everybody. And so I, I'm not, again, I'm not sure how to proceed, but I don't like the idea of just striking because you don't agree with what was transpi transposed or something. Yep. So right, go ahead. I, I would just uh, disagree with the characterization of it being censoring when what's on paper is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, instead, it's correcting it to make it accurate. Okay. Um, but for, again, the ease of moving us along, since we have more important things, frankly, I would simply table this to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan, you were next. I'm going to yeah. say that. I think we need to have mm -hmm. maybe Deb take a look at the video of what exactly was said, because he's not trying to censor, he's saying he watched the videos and these words were not spoken, which yep. is the okay. concern. If, if those words weren't spoken and we're choosing to write these words into our minutes, we perhaps should make sure we have the right words. All right, then I'll entertain a motion to, to table the review. I would withdraw my existing motion and I would move that we table these minutes until next Second All right, seconded by Councilor Penny Jordan. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Moving on, item number 71. To, I'm sorry, we're on a table. May 1st and May 7th. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. We have special meetings on May 1st and May 7th. <laughs> also. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of May 1 and May 7? We could separate them. Is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of May 1? So moved. So moved. Council Randall, a second? Second. Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? It's just May 1. Just May 1 only. <clears throat> All those in favor? It's unanimous. And then also, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of May 7, 2018? So moved. Oh, okay. Councilor Sarah Lennon, and is there a second? Councilor? Jamie Garvin, any discussion? Yep. Okay, Councilor um, Garvin. Just, uh, Deb, it's, it's not a material matter, but um, a couple of names were incorrect. I'd be happy to correct them with you after the fact. That'd be great, thank yeah. you. It was hard to, to yeah. hear some folks, and thank you. Uh, so, uh, is there a, a vote on the motion? Well, do we have to formally amend that then, at, to amend it's the correct just providing the last name that was missed and correcting okay. Sarah to uh, Sandy. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, then is uh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to get a lot there. I know. <laughs> Sure, Council for that, Lennon. For that workshop, yeah. when we're going to review all the protocol, perhaps it makes sense not to summarize what each um, person who came up said, because it seems like very onerous. I know writing, you can't write the whole thing, so you hear some things. Maybe we should just provide the link to the video where people could watch every word verbatim for themselves. I'm just not sure it's appropriate to have every citizen comment in the minutes. It's just well, a suggestion we can discuss it. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep that in mind it for the workshop. To do Thank that. you. Council Lennon. Okay. Uh, it is an order for the town council to remove items number 71 through 76 from the table for action. At our last meeting, we, we tabled those, which were the municipal uh, audit. I'm sorry, the municipal audit on the brain. <laughs> municipal budget and the school budget. So do I have a motion to remove items number 71 through 76 from the table for action? 
So moved. Oh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan moved and Councilor Jamie Garvin seconded. All those in favor? Any discussion, first of all? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Item number 71, municipal budget approval. And so I will just turn this over to the town manager. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this evening what you have uh, for action is the uh, is municipal budget. This is for fiscal year 2019. We have the following gross appropriations that are identified by department uh, that are included within the item for number 71. Uh, for your discussion this evening, if you will uh, also recall last week, the special funds were approved at the uh, at the second part of, mm -hmm. of last week's agenda. Mm -hmm. All right. And you know, uh, if uh, I apologize again, I neglected to ask for the public <laughs> public comment, even though it's stated right on right under the item number. So let me please take this moment. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to comment on the muni municipal budget, it's not not the school budget, just the town side budget. Would anyone like to comment on the municipal budget? No one? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. So, would you okay. like to continue? I have, I have nothing further to say, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to say thank you for, I, I think, a very um, well-crafted budget and um, that is certainly coming in, well, initially anyway, under, <laughs> under any increase. Any, anyone else have any comments on the municipal budget? I just have a question. Councilor Randall? Um, I noticed that line 210, the police department, it's higher than what was in the original draft. And does that include the school resource officer? Because it wasn't yes. as high as I expected to see. Yes, it, uh, what, we, what we ended up increasing the, uh, the 210 line item was by $90,000 okay. uh, from the originally uh, proposed. And then the other item that we did have that was approved last week was the land, uh, sorry, the, uh, the senior. senior citizen uh, uh, property tax assistance uh, program funding as well. So that was approved last week, but this is the only other item. You know, it's, it includes the, the school resource officer in it. Okay. Did you have another question, Councilor I, I just had a follow-up comment. I know that I've expressed this before, and I'll express it again. I know there's a lot of concern about the safety of children in the schools. Um, I strongly believe there are other ways to address safety issues in the schools. I do not support putting a school resource officer or anyone else with a gun in the school. Thank you. Any other comments? I have a question. I'm sorry, um, Councilor Garvin. So, on the senior citizen proposal, just which which account does that come under now, Matt? I, I think that was in special that funds. That was in special funds special. Last, okay. last week. I, when yep. you just referenced it, I yep. yeah, was looking for it here. Yeah, it was in. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. So. Yeah, it was in the larger uh, uh, spreadsheet we had towards the end. Is there a motion to adopt the municipal budget for fiscal year 2019? So moved. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, any further discussion? Councilor Straw? So I assume this would now be the time for us to hash out um, the resource officer for the school, whether we're all on board with it. Um, I personally, uh, to follow up on uh, Councillor Garvin's point earlier, would like to see a finance officer added this year, not next. Um, and then uh, what other items have we really hashed over? Anyone else wants to bring up? It seems like now is the time for that discussion. So. Yes, well, sir. would anyone like to comment? I agree. <laughs> Let's chat. <laughs> well, okay, would you like to? So, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm in support of the resource officer going in the budget, so that's one take off for that. And then can we hear from Matt what the implications are that he thinks of adding a finance officer to the budget? May, uh, may, may I comment for a moment? Oh, sure. As you know, I, I, I brought this up earlier in the year as a something to think about. A, a, Chief Finance Officer for the town, and I'm very much in support of that. I, I'm not sure if it can, how the manager will respond 
budget-wise for this year. The, the one concern I have, if we put it in this year, and, and I, you know, in principle I would favor that, is that we haven't um, had any time to sort of vet how exactly this position would function and interface with other department heads in you know in town. And I, I don't know if we perhaps need time for that or or if the council wants to just go ahead and add that to municipal budget and we figure out the details later. I don't know, but that's one concern I would have. Council Lennon? I agree with you. Um, I, I think it's a complicated position because it's going to cross into all departments and it's going to be a one-town concept and as we've learned that can get complicated. I don't think Matt on the fly can tell us, give us a clue of what that's going to cost us. We don't know what a salary would be, benefits. We don't know how the two or even more than two departments would share it. So with deference, because yep. I agree we need one, I, I personally think, um, and this is a something we've repeated a lot lately, we should send this to a workshop <laughs> to have a, a more robust conversation. And if it has to occur next year, um, so be it. Okay, Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, I'm gonna echo your comments as well as Sarah's that uh, there's work to do to design a job. And I know if we are, uh, and I know it's an item on an agenda here, that if we're going to have a combined school um, town council uh, work sessions, then that's the place where that could sit, defining that job. But what's really positive is that it seems like many of us agree that this is a needed job. It's just what does it look like and what will it cost? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Strong? Uh, so, uh, from my perspective, why I would like to see it added now, and it doesn't have to be a full year position, it can be a half year position, so we have time to nail down what it would be. Uh, at the end of the day, we are seven volunteers. This isn't our full-time job. None of us are CPAs, none of us are accountants. The town doesn't have a single person in a finance department. We have no finance department as a town. Uh, on the school side of the equation, they have uh, an accountant or people that handle payroll and whatnot. But again, what I'm hearing over and over and over again with all of these issues is we have a never ending source of great ideas for how to increase revenue in the town and to work on decreasing expenses, but we don't have anyone to implement them. And the problem with the way that our budget works and well, all of municipal budget works uh, work, if we don't do it as part of this budget, it won't be slated into the budget until next summer. So it won't be until July 2019 that we would have anyone on staff to help us fix any of this. So during the next budget cycle with, for example, the school board, they again will not have the resources as volunteers who have day jobs and other more pressing issues uh, in, going on in their lives. They are volunteers, we are volunteers. Without some professional help to help turn this around, it, it's very disingenuous for us to be criticizing. It, it's very easy to criticize. It's a lot harder to be uh, constructive and accomplish anything. And I feel like we need assistance. It, it, and last point, sorry, is that there's an entity called the GFOA, the Government Financial Officers Association. Every two years, they have a week-long training where it, they will train individuals on uh, what are deemed the best practices around the country for finances with municipalities. Uh, there is an entity in the state of Maine, a local chapter, that will give out scholarships to send employees to this week-long training. Uh, if we want a shot to have them pay for this week-long training, we would have to have someone on the ground by January 1st, perhaps. I don't know the exact deadline, but putting it off when it's gonna be happening next summer means we'll miss out on that and we would not be able to have someone sent to this training, perhaps paid for by, uh, by this organization. Okay. Councilor Garvin. I have a question directed to the manager. Um, what kind of latitude um, within the unassigned fund balance um, would you have to, if, if we were to put together a position description, do recruitment for it and that person started say January 1st, like Chris is suggesting, to pay for it out of unassigned funds and then the plan then to add it to next year's budget. If I may, uh, yeah, there, the council has the ability to fund using that as a vehicle to, to meet that need if you so choose during the mid-year uh, mid approach. Uh, the one thing I will say, just, just thinking about the general concept and, and all, I, I would recommend taking a more pragmatic approach at this point in time just to have the time. I mean, you are looking at having a, a joint workshop with the school department and the school board in June 
uh, you know, presumably June, early July, along those lines, to look at some of those needs, uh, as well as the concept that we discussed during the budget process of uh, human resources director as well. Uh, those are two areas that we do find that there are weakness within the organization uh, that we currently uh, are not meeting to the level that we really should. Uh, I would think you would want to, there's a couple of things that we look at. One is space. Uh, where you're actually physically going to sit a person. Two is job, and more importantly, is job description. How you really, how are you actually going to define the elephant, if you will? Uh, that needs to, you, know, you want to figure out roles, responsibilities, how that interaction will take place with the business manager and the business office at the school side. If you want to look at perhaps a, a larger restructuring, and go along those along that route. Uh, I know in this past year, or in the current budget. The, the, Early version, there was they were looking at providing additional uh, assistance to the business office uh, because they 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 have a great weight that they carry uh, to get all their work done. So that's something I think that's there's a larger part of that conversation that needs to take place. So I, I think if you looked at that and took the better part of six months to define that and, and figure out what that role and responsibility of that person would be, as well as their interaction with the department, I think if you could define that better instead of this evening saying, you know, quite honestly. Kicking 90 grand towards a, towards a finance director and 75 towards an HR director, I'd, rather, I'd much rather look at it more comprehensively and have the ability to come back and make a recommendation to council. And if you looked at that mid-year and found that we could get that and, and approach it from that way, then we could say, okay, I can make a recommendation to council to look at an unassigned fund balance as a as a means to an end, but then also build that in at the beginning of the budget uh, budget conversation, which starts at about you know. We'll be starting earlier in the year as we normally do anyhow. So that would be my recommendation at this point. Okay. Councilor Straw? I, I just say uh, I find that acceptable. That's a good solution. So long as we have that option to use the undesignated fund balance come whenever in order to try to get someone on board. Thank you. Yes. Councilor Kelly Jordan, all set? I agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other comments before we I ask for a, a call for a vote on the, munif on the municipal budget? Councilor Randall. I'd like to just add to my statement about the school resource officer. Um, I brought this up before that I think one of the reasons that we are requesting a school resource officer, that people want one, is because a lot of other municipalities have one. I think that's a terrible reason to do something. Anytime you're saying that we're doing something because everyone else is doing it, that's a terrible reason to make a decision. I don't believe that we need a school resource officer in the schools. I have concerns that behaviors that are very normal among children will become criminal. I have concerns that um, issues that really should be dealt with unofficially through teachers um, will become criminal justice issues. And I would also note that I had a teacher approach me after uh, one of our last meetings when I spoke about this, and he said that he and a number of other teachers do not support having a school resource officer. So before we make a decision to have a school resource officer, I think it's important that we speak with some of the teachers, um, hear some more about data regarding school resource officers, about the benefits of having school resource officers, but also about potential downsides to having school resource officers. I don't think there's a lot of data about this at this point. Um, I just think it's, it's irresponsible to rush into this both um, from a philosophical perspective and from a fiscal perspective. Thank you, Councilor Garvin. Um, I respectfully disagree with Councilor Randall on this. Um, I think that this is a position that has been a point of conversation over a number of years. Um, it's not, this isn't just a one year thing being um, reflexively responsive to um, news events and, and you know an escalating climate of danger in schools, um, but rather one that um, uh, has been discussed before, um, grant uh, opportunities have been pursued before. Um, we've heard in many budget discussions and budget years previously from building administrators, two different superintendents that I can recall on this, if not more, um, as well as uh, a long tenured police chief in town um, that have spoken to um, you know the benefits of having such an officer. Um, I think. I think the questions you've asked around uh, juvenile justice are appropriate, um, and 
you know, from what I heard of the school resource officer from Falmouth that came and spoke to the school board at one of their meetings, as well as from our own police chief, um, you know, that is not something that particularly in this community that they're looking to do, but rather foster productive and um, mentoring type relationships with students and staff. So um, I, you know, particularly think that if, um, if there's any reason to be concerned about um, uh, the potential funding or schedule for any of the other um, discussed and proposed building improvements, um, that this is a necessary first step um, towards better ensuring the safety of our students in our schools. So I support the position. Councilor Penny Jordan. Um, I too want to respectfully disagree with um, your position about not having a, a school resource officer. I believe for a long time, a long, long time, that the relationship between law enforcement, police officers, and young people starts to build at a really young age. And the more present and, and community policing concepts we have, and when we start now considering safety in our schools, and I think about, um, as uh, Jamie has said, the mentoring type relationships, uh, the positive aspects that can occur when um, you you actually have the presence in the school. I don't see it as a criminal justice. I don't see it as a juvenile justice kind of positioning. I see it as um, it's about community and it's about building relationships. And I felt that way for a long time. And I think it's a really positive move. I don't see that we're following any towns. Uh, we're doing something that we've talked about for a long, long time. And I think it's a good move. I support it. Um, Councilor Straw? I, I would just note that uh, I share uh, a number of Councilor Randall's concerns, uh, and I greatly appreciate her uh, uh, stepping forward with their concerns. Um, the oddity of the situation is my daughter tells me there is an Officer Dave, Officer Dan, uh, someone that is on campus all the time already. So it is. it almost seems like we already have a resource officer. Um, I also greatly recognize um, Penny Jordan, Councilor Penny Jordan's uh, point that the officer will be serving in a somewhat different role than a traditional police officer in that they're almost a quasi-social worker of some sort. Um, the only reason I will support it is the hope that it will reduce the overtime that we're having in the police department, which is not that high, but nevertheless, occurs primarily, I understand, in the summer, and this resource officer in the summertime would not be in the schools, but would instead help reduce the overtime during that period of time. But other, that, otherwise, the concept coupled with the proposal with the IT tech for the schools where there was a discussion of cameras in all of the hallways and these lockdown doors, it, it, it doesn't sit well with me, but I will nevertheless support it because of the overtime. Councilor Randall? Um, just to respond to uh, the points that Councillors um, Garvin and Jordan brought up, what I'm referring to when I say we haven't seen data on the benefits or heard about it, we've heard anecdotal data. And um, the, the school board did have um, some school resource officers speak about their experiences. They had some other school departments speak about it. I'm, I'm speaking about a larger trend that we haven't seen data on a large scale about the impact of this. I think that there are real, I, I am happy to have a wonderful police department in this town. I think that the police department does a fantastic job. I think um, it seems like they already have great relationships with the students. I would note the police department is essentially on the same campus as the schools. They do already have officers who are in the schools. Um, I do think it's a, it's a positive thing to have students have a good relationship with law enforcement, but I also think that there's a balance and there, there is a place for law enforcement and there's a place for the rest of society, the things that we do in privacy. There are privacy concerns that are raised about having police officers in other spaces and I think it's a, it's a concerning trend 
Um, I would like to see Cape Elizabeth stand out from that trend, find other ways to continue to develop, creative, to, to develop positive relationships between young people and law enforcement without having a school resource officer. I also think that some of the benefits that have been identified, such as having students have someone um, in a mentor position or someone that they can connect with, those are roles that should not be served by law enforcement. That's something that I, I philosophically disagree with. I think if we're going to be devoting funds to establishing another position for a mentor, I don't believe that that person should be wearing a badge and carrying a gun. I think that there are more positive ways we can go about it. Thank you, Councilor Randall. Anyone else? I, I have a few thoughts. I'm sort of in the middle of, of everyone, at, surprisingly, but anyway. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, I, I do not, I, I actually appreciate Councilor Randall's points, also Councilor Straws. Uh, I think these are the times we're living in. Um, I think the, um, the school resource officer, however, should be paid for by the school department, or we should be fund, or the town should be funded, because I have some other philosophical issues. I I don't understand why you know an additional. I still don't understand why an additional custodian is go going to that budget. I believe they added another one yet last year as well, and you know want us to fund the the student resource officer. I, I'm not particularly opposed to having one in the schools, not really, but I, I do think that the town should be re reimbursed for that. And I think that we have, I think that should be, as I say, a school funded resource officer. And I think that there are other things on the town side that we need to be taken care of. And, um, and I think that while we're happy, you know, we certainly have great police officers who would, could serve in this role, um, I think that we should at least be funded for that position. So I will oppose the municipal budget based solely on that. I don't think the student resource, resource officer, while I'm, I'm happy to have the school have this, I think that that is their purview. I think that they should reimburse the town for that. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Caitlin Jordan. I guess I, I don't understand the rationale. I mean, if we move the $90,000 from our budget over to the school board's budget, the same people are paying for it and it's gonna cost them the exact same amount of money, correct? I mean, do we get a better deal That's if it goes correct. out of one budget than no. the other? No. So then, I mean, I think we need to try and really char start focusing on the one town concept. Whether or not it's in the school board's budget or it's in our budget, the same people are paying for it. So we really need to nail that into our brains because it doesn't make a difference. If you believe we need a resource officer, or you don't, it's coming out of the same pockets. So. Councilor Sarah Lennon, I think, is next. Can I make a suggestion just in light of the 10-page agenda we have before <laughs> us tonight? Why don't we consider this a one-year beginning? Um, let's vote on the municipal budget. We've already had many conversations about this. And see how it goes. And if it's not particularly helpful, well, next year we won't put it in the budget. Um, if it is fabulous, then we'll ask the school board to pay for it next year. I mean, let's just dip our toe in and keep moving because we could actually be here for another hour talking about this. We, we seem to be like really stuck on this one topic. So I just think we should keep going. It, it's a one year gig. Well, I'm, I'm just about ready to move the question, but the <laughs> town manager would like to weigh in. Just, just the one uh, point of clarification, if I, if I may, uh, relating to the uh, we will also be pursuing a COPS, uh, a COPS um, grant, grant as well, and that's a three-year commitment if that happens. So it's uh, basically about half, half the anticipated salary on a, on a startup policeman. And one other point also, if I could, when we do have an officer in the schools, that is an officer that's been taken off the road for doing the patrols, and we've done that at the request specifically as a result of some of the... Uh, horrific events that have taken place this spring to, to, to have uh, an officer there. And then on the, uh, and the other point I would say is, uh, you know, Officer Dave uh, just re returned uh, from being with the students for a week at Chewankee uh, and reported on that this morning. So uh, there, is, there is a positive relationship that he does have. And I, I, I think yeah, it's hard for me not to be sympathetic to Councilor Randall's uh, thought process. And I've 
wrestled with that myself as well. Uh, it's, you know, obviously this is a council level decision to, to make. I do support uh, the recommendation from the chief as well uh, to to pursue this as, as an officer. But I think one year, A, it's, it's very difficult to recruit anybody, uh, especially if someone was leaving you know, one department to come here. Uh, but it, you know, everything is flexes on, on this evening's uh, results of what the council decides. So we're happy to pursue anything the council council deems. Council Garvin? I'm trying to be respectful of time, but I do have important points I want to make. So um, the first is regarding the funding. Um, I think that one of the most fundamental responsibilities of the government of this town is to provide for the public safety of its citizens. There are 1,500 or so students that are citizens of this town that deserve to be protected when they go to school. So I fundamentally believe that this is something that the town should provide for. Um, and I think it's, that, I'll just leave that at that. Okay. Second of all, um, I hope that this officer never has to do anything in the school. Obviously, we all hope for that. Um, I think that um, the times that we live in are um, so filled with unimaginable things that could happen. But we all hope that whichever officer is in any of the schools would never, be, would never have to do anything in the face of any of those unimaginable things. We've just this year had an incident, thankfully didn't escalate to something more serious. Um, you know, we all live here and think that it could never happen here. There are so many towns across America where there are citizens and parents that thought that very same thing. And I will say that I will not sit up here at this council dais and ever have to look somebody in the eye that came here and said, you had the opportunity to hire somebody. You had the opportunity to fund this position. Why didn't you do it? So I will firmly support this. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Penny Jordan. I'm going to um, echo uh, Councilor Garvin's words that um, I truly believe that we as a town and we as town government have an obligation to all citizens to ensure their safety and I truly believe, this is personally, that our police department is charged with that responsibility. I also agree with Caitlin that um, if we truly believe in a one town concept, then let's step back and let's apply that rule to this because to me, this is a no brainer. It's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I agree with you. I just think that we all are owed our philosophical differences yep. on how a budget is created. I certainly know that it all comes out of ultimately the same pocket. I just think that we should be at least having some assistance in funding for the position. But, but I'm in support of the position. So I'll call the question. Is there a motion to, I think I already yeah, did. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor of the municipal budget? All those opposed? Five to two. All right, thank you. Moving on. Next item is item number 72. I think what most people are here for, the school budget approval. At this moment, I'd like to invite the public to comment. We have a maximum of 15 minutes uh, for this, um, and that's three minutes per individual. If you would like to address this item, would you please come to the podium and give us your name and address? Hi, nice to see you all. I'm John Christie, I'm at 6 Albion Road. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having served on the school board for six years, uh, I understand um, the decision that you face tonight. I'm, I'm standing up tonight in support of the school budget. Um, uh, and I just wanna offer uh, an observation, which I sent to you by email, but late in the day. And um, I don't know whether everyone's had a chance to see it, but uh, one of the greatest difficulties of School, the school budget process in Maine is, is the volatility of the state funding formula. Uh, everything else in the budget uh, from year to year is more or less uh, stable. Uh, enrollment changes a little bit from year to year. 
energy prices vary, um, teacher salaries uh, vary a little bit from year to year, uh, health care costs vary, but the, the state share of funding um, on the revenue side is extremely volatile. And uh, this is a point I, I will make any time I have an opportunity to speak with one of our representatives in Augusta, um, because a lot of the agony of uh, addressing the school budget every year is just in response to the volatility of that one, that one number. And so this year, uh, we have a particularly precipitous dip in the state funding of over $800,000. And for that reason, the, 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 the school budget, which is um, a, a proposed budget, which is an increase um, of 3.1%, which is consistent with the school budget increases over the last 10 years, um, produces a different impact on the town uh, than it produces in other years. But I would just want to point out to you that we have other kinds of years when the uh, the state share increases unexpectedly. Um, it happened not long ago, it will happen again. And in those years, the school budget increase, if you look back at school budgets over the last 10 years, the school budget increase will also be around on the order of three to four percent. So the school department is doing what the legislature should be doing, which is providing for steady and consistent funding for the education of our children, uh, the legislature is instead providing this very volatile uh, funding formula. And, and that's what produces the, the challenge we have before us tonight. So uh, I hope, again, that you'll recognize that in, in years when, when funding is up from the state, the school budget remains consistent, uh, and that you'll support the budget tonight. And thank you all for your service. Thank you. Good evening, Kathy Ray, 532 Spurwink Avenue. Um, eight years on the school board, including two years as chair. Six years on the town council, including one year as chair. Um, I would like to see you folks not rubber stamp the school budget this evening. Uh, I think that it's important that you think about the town as a whole. Um, I've worked with most of you, and I think that you were talking about the resource officer a short time ago. Um, if the schools need a resource officer, it's not for the town council to discuss, it's for the schools to discuss and put it in their budget. Um, as, the schools, um, as, as the schools have lost um, students, they've been going down over the years, for many years, and the budget's been going up. Um, I think it's uh, very concerning that we have a 10.2% tax increase on the school budget this year. It's nice that the town is offsetting that by lowering their budget, but I will be voting against the school budget, and I will be encouraging everybody that I know to vote against the school budget because it's not about not supporting the schools. I do. I went to the schools here. My husband did, my family did, and my husband's family did. Um, I do support the schools, but I think that the budget is too high. I think it's a little out of control, and I would hope that you would do your job and not rubber stamp it again this year, which it has been done for several years. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm uh, Tom Dunham. I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane. Um, what really troubles me with the school budget is the $249,000 that we are being asked to spend in this difficult year <clears throat> toward um, a future cost of 27 or 28 million dollars. I think it's very inappropriate. I think we need to um, have um, town-wide discussions on the future um, expenditure of 27 and 28 million dollars. 
Um, <clears throat> if people are concerned about the current rise of 10.2% this year, you can imagine what it is when <clears throat> the bond comes, we are asked to fund a bond for $27 million. It's a lot of money in a, <clears throat> in a school system that is with declining enrollment and increasing salaries. I, I just don't understand it. I am certainly going to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Sutherland, 379 Spurring Avenue. Could you repeat your last name? <laughs> Sorry. Hello, my name is Chris Sutherland. Thank I you. I live on 379 Spurring Avenue. Um, I come before you as a high school teacher. I taught in the Portland School District, taught in Cumberland. I now teach in Westbrook. Um, I would ask that you, before you take this vote, to really ponder the implications statewide. Um, as the first speaker mentioned, there's obviously no leadership uh, from Augusta and from the way I see it and from the way the Maine Educational Association sees it, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure being put on districts to obviously make up for the funding and also to kind of take leadership of their own school systems. Um, the proficiency-based diploma is soon to be voted out. There's just a lot of mandates from Augusta that, that aren't going to come to fruition. So as the districts now are kind of saddled with this, this pressure, um, I think that it's really important that as a body, as a governmental body, that you, you understand that you're sending a message um, to the teachers in your own district and you're sending a message to teachers in other districts and across the state. Uh, I teach in Westbrook right now. We are in fact finding and we're moving towards work to rule. We have our issues. And it's a very similar issue where there's this kind of cynicism and notion around public school that there's this, this idea of waste or extravagance. I've worked in four different high schools. I've seen no extravagance and no waste. Uh, teachers are doing what, you know, doing an incredible job with what they have. And, you know, I'm not a budget person. As a teacher, I, I could imagine in a few years that'll be another responsibility that we'll be saddled with. You know, it, it's, it's just really important to understand that this is the schoolhouse and, um, you know, teachers at this point are, you look at what's happening in North Carolina, what took place in Arizona, West Virginia, in the state of Maine as well, is kind of on its way where districts are going to be making decisions that are going to cause a decline in morale and a decline in belief in the public school. And it's one of the last places in the town where the doors are open to everyone. And I think that it's really important. This is not just a budget issue. It's a, it's a philosophical issue. It's a political issue. And before you take this vote, just keep in mind what message you're sending to your teachers and, and to other school districts around you. Because they also are going to be coming up with this issue. Because it's not going to go away. Thank you. Tim Thompson, 6 Pine Ridge Road. Uh, first of all, thank you all for all the good work that you do. Um, I'm not, it's, it sounds like we passed a resource officer, right? That's in the town budget now. So I'm really happy that we did. I don't disagree with Jessica very often, but on this one I, I do. I understand her reason for not doing it, but I think it solves, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of young parents out there with young children that uh, that's a big, that's their, kind of the number one item that I hear from them. They are concerned about that from a safety standpoint. My guess is our chief will find the right person for that job. And I think to Chris's point, we'll be able to use that person in the, in the summertime. So I'm, I'm happy to see that we did that. Um, my hope is uh, by, by getting that in place, and hopefully we could have that in place by the first of the year, to take a little bit of the concern off from a safety standpoint. Because I do think that's one of the things that's driving the need to, to do this building uh, study. Uh, I, I strongly feel this year that uh, if, if there was any way we could push that building study off with the difficult year that we're having, the, the over 10% uh, requests from our taxpayers that are many of them are on fixed income. Uh, a lot of people do uh, give me a feedback for whatever reason. I think I've lived in this town too long. but. Uh, 
that 10% increase is going to be a real challenge. I'm, I'm telling you that uh, as much as I talk to them about the reasoning, uh, as much as you try to explain the EPS formula, uh, you know, what they come back to me and they're, they're worth $7.7 .7 million over what that formula calls for. And if you look around the state, that excess over what the EPS formula calls for is significantly higher than just about any. A good friend of mine's on the Baldwin School Committee. Their budget is uh, $16 million. EPS formula calls for them to have $14 million, so they're $2 million over, and apparently most schools do go that far. But 66% of their budget's paid for by the state. 66% okay? of their kids get economic assistance and free lunch. Okay? We're a little bit different out of here. I think we have about 6%, pretty small, small percentage of our. So it's a big difference, but they're only $2 million off of that. And I've talked to some of the, I, I, I'm not going to say who it was, but one of the prin uh, principals was sitting next to me. The school district that he came from, they absolutely treat that EPS formula like the gospel. And they, they couldn't really understand. We basically pay no attention to it. What we need for people like me is a better understanding of why we're $7.7 .7 million over $4,854 $4, per student over what the EPS formula calls for. So if there's any way in this tough environment we can push that study out, which it's really different, the approach is very different from how we've done these things in the past. First of all, we've never gone to the town for 27 to 28 Mr. Million. Thompson, your time is up. Uh, if you could wrap so up your comments. On, on that size of a item, I'd love to see us get a better process in place, get more support for that, and ultimately have a success in that project. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Altenberg, and I live at 31 Old Colony Lane. Um, I'm on the school board, I'm the vice chair, and I just wanted to talk for a moment about this $27 million number that keeps coming up. Um, it doesn't exist. That's not the number that we're talking about. We're talking about a feasibility study that is essential and necessary, and I implore Anybody from the public, I know you can talk to the superintendent, the facilities manager, um, I'm sure the town manager would take you into these buildings and see how dire the need is to do some work in the schools. Uh, the safety piece is definitely uh, a concern. The fact that somebody coming into the building reaches our cafetorium for the middle school in Pond Cove and the gym full of students with the first adult being over 100 yards away. I don't know, I kind of see that as a problem. Forget the fact that the lunch uh, facility, the cafetorium, is not uh, a very healthy environment for our students to be spending their lunch time. Forget the fact that Wi-Fi cannot be accessed throughout all parts of the school when our students do the majority of their work via Wi-Fi. Um, and the, there's no generator that would keep the buildings in the middle school and the lower school. So my point being is that we are not talking about $27 million right now. We do not know what this feasibility study is gonna pull up. So I'd like that not to be considered on the table. What we're talking about is this extensive $250,000 feasibility study with a plan of how to go forward. If we do not start putting money into our schools, they will fall apart, their lifespan will end, and we will be in a lot more trouble. And I'm gonna ask Councillor Straw, I know this isn't a question or answer, but I'm referring to a comment he made. I'm not as, um, well, if we put this off another year, you were talking about interest rates and that if we were to do this, this is inevitable. This is not a when we do this, this is an if we do it. And interest rates are so low that if, if we take advantage of it now, we have the potential to save ourselves from hundreds of thousands of dollars, if I'm correct, according to Mr. Straw's calculation, roughly. I heard a, a, um, I heard a quote of $600,000 just jotting down roughly. So I think that's a substantial amount of money for us to put this in. It's something that has to be in. And again, I encourage you 
to go look at the buildings. The other thing I'd like to say, and I know my time is running out, but in this whole budget process, which I've been to every meeting for, a comment that Howard Coulter, Superintendent Coulter made, is that if we were to cut the budget your back. Your time is up, so please wrap up your comments, Mrs. Albert. Thank you. That if we were to cut the budget back, this district would not be recognizable. I have a sixth grader, I have a seventh grader, and I have a ninth grader. And it makes me fearful that this district will not provide and be the same district for my sixth grader as my ninth grader. So I ask you to please at least put this out for the townspeople to vote on. Thank you. Thank you. David Plumpton, 1000 Sawyer Road. I've already overdone my welcome with my email to you, but I just Really, the card before is before the horse on this, on this uh, 20 cent well or whatever it is bond issue. In 2014, you had a CIP process that talked about for 2016 through 2024 the capital needs, a CIP process for the schools, 1.75 million dollar bond for the schools in 2016, and. If the safety problems have been around so long, why weren't they addressed then? And the, the bond issue is something that the town pays for, the town initiates. The, this money should not have been incurred and it shouldn't be paid for by the town. If you want to have a CIP process and the schools think there are needs, come forward and ask the town to authorize a study or start a CIP process. I mean, there's been no discussion of why all of a sudden this thing comes out of nowhere when the town went through this a couple of years ago. So, you know, I've heard nothing about that. So that's why that 250000 ought to be out of the budget. And the $60,000 janitor for, you know, fewer students, the, the space, that, that hasn't been incurred. Take it out and maybe have a better chance of getting the thing passed. And I will be voting against the budget. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> John Volts, 33 Phillip Road, also a school board member. I just wanted to comment briefly about a little bit people have sort of asked, how did we get here? Why is the tax increase so big this year? And the answer is this is not a one-year issue. If you look at the school budget, the school budget overall itself has, has, has marched up at a slow percentage rate that is in concert with what we've had the last few years, which is a flat student body. It's not been declining. It was declining. It's been flat. It's expected to be flat or probably potentially growing a little bit next year. It's flat. But salaries go up. So what's happened in the past few years is when we got more money from the state, we got like $900,000 more from the state, but didn't go into the school budget. It went in the pocket of the taxpayers. We didn't sort of save that additional money and spend it and spread it out knowing that the state money is going to go up and down. When it went up, we returned it. The next year, school cut, cut our budget, and we didn't, the town didn't make up the difference. We made up a little bit of the difference, and then we sucked it out of unassigned funds, knowing what happens, that you can't do that every year. Then again, this year, we did it again. So now there's no more place to put it back. It's like if you want to go back and look at what has been over three years, we should have raised, we should have been addressing this a year, two years ago. We should have been addressing it a year ago. There's no more place left to put it. We either have to decide we're going to invest in our schools or we're not going to have good schools. You, you can't do it forever. We haven't had a major capital improvement to our structure. We've done capital improvements to keep where we're at since they built the kindergarten wing back in what, 1992 or 2000, it's almost like 20 years. So we haven't had it. If you don't think we need it, come visit the schools. Come see what the school buildings look like. Come see what the, the state of the janitorial is. We're not living off the fat of the land here. I, will, I invite anyone to come see. We got here because we've ignored this problem for years and years and years. And now we're here and we're saying either, uh, it's very clear, Augusta doesn't believe in what we're doing here. Do we? I do. I hope you do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kimberly Carr. I'm at 19 Rockcrest Drive. Um, I'm on the school board 
I have five kids. Um, I have a three-year-old. I have a 14-year-old. I have several in between. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess I am just here um, to second the comment about um, we're sending a philosophical message. I have a 16-year-old niece who's very interested in teaching. She's fabulous with kids. She'd be a great educator. The state of public education right now is terrifying for young, young kids coming along. She doesn't, she doesn't, you know, there's safety issues for sure, but I think if we continue to show that we're devaluing public education by not funding, funding school budgets that have really no crazy increases in them. They're, we're not doing anything incredible this year. There's lots of incredible things we could have been doing. We're just trying to provide the consistent education that we've been providing. And I think, I think it, it's a really important time in our town. We're at really critical crossroads. And, and as we said, Augusta's not doing it. And I think, I, I just hope that as a community, going forward in other years, we can come up with other solutions than increasing taxpayers' um, contributions each year. But for this year, that's where we are. And I hope you'll still kind of budget. Thank you. I'd like to just mention to the council that we are at just beyond our 15-minute limit. Um, is the council satisfied with keeping our 15 minutes holding to that without expending it? Okay. All right. Thank you. I'd be willing to extend it if there were people we have not yet heard from who wanted to make comments, but I don't see anyone waiting at the podium. So. All right. Well, shall we ask if there's anyone that would like to speak to us that we have not heard from before? With council approval, we would extend, what, another 10 minutes or something? Yeah, sure. another, okay. All right. And your name and address, please. Jana Zimmerman, 81 Oakhurst Road. So I have been here for many, many years. And I have watched the schools decline over years. And I have heard people say we have an excellent school district. But we have an excellent school district in Maine. And we rely a lot on, like, when I emailed all of y'all and I CC'd the school board. Um, I got a reply back from the president of the school board. And she talked about, had I seen the latest US News report? And I have. But I think it's a statistical anomaly that we're even in it. So I'm composing an email to her. There are things about this town that are uniquely a skewed data pool. And that makes us slip in numbers one and two on the way you get into that. And then we have, on the other side of the skewed data pool, we have a number of people who take AP classes. And that gets us in there. And what they consider is a very limited amount of information about the schools. Now, I'm a, I have thought many, many times that I should secretly video the schools so that you can see what I see. The schools. I can show you places that are completely unsafe. I should tell you, I used to be a child welfare worker. And then I was a psychologist in a secure psychiatric unit and state hospital. And then I became a neuropsychologist. And some of the work I've done has been with people who have antisocial tendencies. And I can think of, because a part of my training is learning to think like them. And I can show you so many dangerous places in that very declining school system. It is totally non-secure. And it's unsafe in so many different ways, but it also is not built in a way that promotes learning. I used to be a teacher, too. Um, and uh, started out with children in psychology. So I can just point out to you so many different ways that the school system strains with a very, very limited budget that does not change year to year very much at all. And what changes is a state contribution, and it's uncontrollable. There's no predictability. Sometimes it changes two and three times before they decide on a final number. 
So it's, it's really a difficult situation that the school strains against to be able to provide adequate funding for each and every student. I don't think it's an excellent school district. When I moved here, I thought I had researched it well enough that it was, that I had met my standards. I got here and I found out that this really is not a town that perhaps understands what an excellent school district is. Mrs. Zimmerman, your time is up. You could please wrap up your comments. Mm -hmm. I will. But if that's the case, I don't think that they understand that there's a larger national and international economy that is fueling the differences in our school district and those, and we are woefully behind. Thank you for your service, and thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Is anyone else interested in speaking? <laughs> okay, thanks. We will close the public comment period and uh, start our deliberations on item 72, the school budget approval. So, why don't I go ahead and ask for a motion and a second, if someone would like to make it, and then we can be begin our discussion, if that's how you'd like to begin. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Uh, for a motion, do we have to go through all the orders, or can I just make a motion that we approve the school budget for $25,641,276? Sound good? Yes. Is there a second? Councilor Lennon, any discussion? I didn't have a chance to look while you were saying that very quickly. It's uh, the, the number that's on the agenda. On the agenda, that's great. That's also great. the school Got board's it. final Got number it. Right. includes everything. Can I ask yep. a question? So that 25 million includes all of those numbers previous? Yeah, it's just the number, the total. Because those don't add up to... Well, that's um, interesting. I think the town manager has a comment. Oh, good. <laughs> if, if, if I may, uh, Councilor Jordan, if, uh, just a friendly, uh, a friendly thought. Uh, you may want to uh, identify and make the motion to accept items uh, on item number 72, uh, numbers one through eight, as as identified with the funds identified as as stated. That that may work in that way. I don't want to see, quite, quite honestly, uh, you miss anything that, that may not be complete, contained within that first start, first part. So basically what you're suggesting is that we, we uh, approve all the items, one through eight in item number 72, for the amount of 25641076 is that what you're saying? Well, you Rather than, because... Councilor Penny Jordan's concerned they're not adding up so See, much. I don't, I don't think you have everything, everything contained in, within there. You've got okay. the cost center summary and then you have the local funding or the state and local EPS funding allocation in two and then the non-state funded debt service in three, food service transfer in four, additional local funds in five and so on and so forth. So I think you would want to, if, if your motion is to accept them as they're currently stated, I would say. Uh, orders one through eight. Yeah, of, of order number 72, of item number 72 would probably be the cleanest way to make sure that you wouldn't overlook anything. I also want to make sure we got everything. So I, well, that's what I was kind of asking in my motion now, which was the best way to, to go about it. So technically, though, we have a motion. So I need to amend my motion to specifically include all orders one through eight of item 72-2018. Mm -hmm. That clean it up. So I need a yep. second and a vote on the amendment. Second your amendment. Second your amendment. And so we vote on the amendment. Yeah. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Okay. Shall we begin? <laughs> 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 Councilor Randall. <laughs> I'll jump right in. So um, I want to be very clear because I think that what I'm about to say will be somewhat unpopular among um, some residents. I 100% support the proposed 3.1% increase in the school budget. 
I have no doubt that the schools need the money that they ask for. The issue that I have is with the feasibility study. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about my role as a town councilor. We've gotten a lot of interesting emails, um, and it's been great to hear from everybody from both sides. But the place that I've come to is that in my role as a town councilor, um, part of my job is to ensure, a lot of my job is to ensure that the, the taxpayer money is being spent responsibly. And um, I've heard from the school board that the feasibility study, it's not about a 27 or $28 million bond, but we are the gatekeepers for the spending. And currently, as proposed, as the project has been brought to us, it was proposed as a potentially 27 or $28 million project. A lot of the um, proposed renovations are things that don't address safety. I fully support the, the parts of um, the renovations that go directly to safety. I fully support this um, idea of renovating the cafetorium. I think it's very important that uh, young people have a healthy, clean space to eat in and that they're not rushed. I think it's very important that the students are safe and that they're not in a position where they're exposed to um, potentially dangerous people entering the building. However, we can't approve the feasibility study with this caveat that they only study the certain parts of it that we approve of. And because we have that limit, I can't responsibly say yes to the feasibility study. I think what we need to do is um, narrow the scope of the project and talk more carefully about what potentially um, the bond will be going towards which renovations, which issues will be studied by the feasibility study. So to be very clear, to reiterate my point, I think the school board did an excellent job of working with limited resources this in a very difficult year. I think it's fantastic that they managed to, um, to consolidate things so much and trim things up. I would support you know, more of that funding, the, the 249,000 going towards additional services for the children, additional teachers maybe, other things like that, but I don't feel that I can responsibly um, support it going towards the feasibility study. I think, I think Councilor Caitlin Jordan was next. Um, as you pointed out about not being able to limit the scope of the study, unfortunately the reality is if you cut $250,000 out of the thing, cause, out of the budget, because you don't want them to do the feasibility study. You can't tell them, I'm taking 250000 out of your budget and you can't do the feasibility study. They could turn around and do the feasibility study and cut $250,000 out of somewhere else. Um, so just saying that you don't approve the budget because you don't want them to do X isn't going to help the process, because I very much remember a few years ago, we, the council, basically forced the school board to cut some money out of the budget, and they cut some things that we didn't want them to actually cut. But that's what they did, because that's where they thought they should cut the, the money from. And so we can't tell them where to cut the money from. So that's a tough spot to be put in. At the same time, I would think the whole concept that we've been talking about in public, on record, is that we're going to do this feasibility study in the process of very open town involvement, input from the town, input from the citizens, input from the school department, as to where that feasibility study travels to, which is what you were saying. You wish you could direct and tell them what to do, but we can't specifically, but you can get people to put the input that's going to drive the train in the direction that hopefully the town wants. I think Councilor Lennon was next. Okay. Um, I understand your concerns, Valerie, and I agree with Caitlin's point. I think you should be reassured to know that this is literally step one in like a hundred step process, which will be vetted um, by committees and meetings for probably years. And in the end, the council will continue to be the gatekeeper 
for the final number that gets put out to vote to borrow the money, because anything over a million dollars um, by our town charter must be voted on. So in the end, um, rest assured that the citizens themselves will decide, and they will decide what parts of that feasibility study they approve of and what they don't. Um, because if the school board chooses to put something out that's larger than they want or encompasses more, it will be voted down, just like the library was. You've heard that story. It was eight million. Citizens said, no, thank you. Redid the entire thing, went out for four million. So I believe that it's pure democracy that the citizens in the end will decide if they want renovations at all, and if they do, which ones they would choose and which ones they wouldn't. So I'm seeing this 249,000 as actually potentially a money saver in that it will be, make very clear to the citizens exactly what they're choosing. If we don't have that, people won't know what they're going to get to choose. Um, and may end up with a higher price tag than they would like. Part of why the library didn't pass is because people got a really good look at what they were buying and said, no, thank you. So I'm seeing this as money invested in a much wiser choice for the community. Councillor Penny Jordan? I think what happened with this whole and um, quote unquote feasibility study is uh, that there's a feeling that the train left the station. Because I agree with you, Valerie. I, I think if you you take and you look at this this price tag that has been alluded to out there of 27 million, that you look at this and go, the train's left the station. If we let the train keep going, then are we going to be down the road with this bigger price tag than what we want? I. I I personally can't support it, this, these dollars, because of the way the project's been structured. And if I were going to, and I know the school board has done a, a lot of work and, and some good work, but the project needs to be structured based on uh, what we found with that initial brush through of the uh, looking at our schools and our infrastructure has brought us to these pieces. And these pieces, and everybody's saying them, these pieces are about security, the cafetorium, the, uh, the generator, the wiring, and those things that uh, are, are bubbling to the top. And I think if people could hear those tangibles, they might be able to wrap their head around this. But what I get concerned about is when you um, send engineers off to do a full-blown design uh, at another level of detail, and you're paying them to do some level of design on something that you know won't even make it onto the uh, radar that we're expending dollars unnecessarily. And so I just look at it from uh, the way the project's designed and the dollars are not being expended in, in a really focused way. So I agree with you, Valerie. Councilor Randall? Um, just to, to add something, um, I, I understand, Councilor Lennon, um, your point about being the gatekeeper again um, when it comes to the bond, but in my professional life, I would never tell a client to accept a settlement based on a promise that's not in the agreement. And I think in line with um, what Councillor Jordan said, that the train left the station and it's going. Um, and I just want to make sure that at every step of the way, I am being true to my duties as a counselor. Thank you. Any other counselors want to comment? Councilor Straw? Um, I guess right now we're really focused on the architectural fees, so I'll try to focus just on that right now. Um, I have spent uh, a significant, 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 significant amount of time over the last few months going through this data. Um, we'll cover that as we go here. Um, this aspect, everything that has been said, uh, has given me pause. Um, one aspect that was raised was the, the uh, 1.75 million or whatnot that uh, was, uh, I believe, bundled in with the library bond, but I could be wrong. Um, I went back and I looked at that, um, and basically that bond um, 
was basically focused on issues that had come up in what is known as the Harriman Report. Um, basically, we went through and did an inventory of we, the town, we, the school board, went through and did a inventory of these town's uh, buildings in roughly 2010, 2011, which was then bundled in this report that came out in 2012. As part of that, basically, I sat down, I read the entire report this weekend because I didn't have anything else to do. Um, <laughs> softball, baseball, living a life. Um, so what that document basically contained was an inventory of, it, it basically summarized an inventory of what we have right now in the schools in the form of buildings. Um, and it set forth proposals on how to maintain it. It specifically did not in any way entail uh, setting out improvements in needs that existed in the school. Um, moreover, the Harriman Report, if I recall correctly, was premised on the idea that we are in a period of declining enrollment and it had projections for student population, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but we're approximately 1,400 by this year. We actually have over 1,600 students. So it had made assumptions that are not accurate. And the conclusions in the Harriman Report are therefore not accurate because they're based on false assumptions. Um, it makes sense not to spend money on buildings in a situation of declining enrollment. I strongly believe, although it's me reading the tea leaves, that we're going to see an enrollment number around 1610 to 1620 next year when I extrapolate out the data. Um, we are not at 1570, which was the expectation last year. We are at over 1600. In other words, we are running 30 kids higher than the, than the district, than the school district anticipated just last year. We are in a period of leveling out and eventual growth in enrollment. So the Harriman Report, to the extent we're going to look at what it contains, its recommendations, those were based on assumptions that are no longer accurate. Um, it set out concepts of what we should do in order to maintain the existing facilities. It never contemplated what improvements need to be made if we have an enrollment of 1,600. And for that reason, that's why I think we don't see the security concerns we don't see the cafetorium, et cetera, et cetera, in the Harriman report. Um, so I did just want to touch on that because of the fact that a number of people have brought up the, we're looking to do with this feasibility study, basically a repeat of the Harriman report. Um, the distinction for me is that the Harriman report was, how do we maintain the existing facilities? This concept is, how do we do improvements in order to better meet the needs of the kids and address these pain points that we have? So that's the distinction. Moreover, as, but the problem, as what one of the commentators um, noted, is that these buildings are misaligned for our educational needs. It kind of stinks to throw money at buildings that are not properly structured for a modern educational environment. We basically have cobbled together buildings over the last 100 years. Um, and if you were to start from scratch, you would never design your educational buildings in this way. So why do we continue to throw resources at them? And I kind of want to do over of the workshop we had when we were presented with the uh, deterioration schedule and w where you do repairs in order to maximize lifespan. Because what wasn't touched on is, have we reached a point where the efficiency of the buildings for modern educational learning needs uh, just isn't there, such that we are better off with new buildings? I don't know, but it's something that I wonder, should we be throwing resources at buildings that we are better off building new ones? Um, as to whether to the point that, uh, that uh, Valerie, uh, Councillor Randall brought up, you would never, uh, be, would you ever tell your client to accept something where there's no binding uh, uh, commitment? And that's my concern. Um, I, greatly wish that the proposal had just been the cafetorium and the security entrance. I really wish what I keep calling the clubhouse was not in there and the changes to the weight room and other things at the high school. I don't think those should have been included. They are. What does this report can entail? Is it we're pushing up on all the tiles, looking around, all of this other stuff? I would much rather have had it cabin to we're just doing the security, we're just doing the cafetorium. Unfortunately, it's our fault. It is us, the town council's fault, 
that it includes everything, in my opinion. The school board repeatedly tried to sit down with us in order to hash all of this out before they finalized their budget, and we wouldn't meet with them. If we had been able to sit down and go through this with them, we would have been able to address these issues with them beforehand. So I take that into consideration as well. And at the end of, I've talked enough, I apologize. So um, <laughs> I could go on for like three hours um, and no one wants to do that. So uh, I'll stop talking now. That was clarifying. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Um, with the feasibility study going along the whole lot, uh, analogy we got going on with the train leaving the station, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and perhaps Howard could address it if I am wrong. I would love to be corrected. My thought is you've picked a destination. They kind of threw out maybe we can make it to you know California from here, and that's the, the grand prize, the field house, the $27 million, right? And that kind of got thrown out. But then once you start thinking about, all right, you know, I got to buy the tickets, I got to pack this, I, well, maybe actually I'll just go to Kansas, right? And so you scale your, your, your train hasn't left yet. You just opened the book and said, oh, California looks pretty, right? But you haven't actually gone anywhere. And that's what I think they kind of presented to us. You could have a field house, you could have this, you know, you could have the world. Now let's do a feasibility study talk about what actually needs to get done, how many dollars does it cost to do this, this, and this, and then maybe you're not gonna make it to California. You're gonna only make it, nothing's wrong with Kansas, but you're only gonna, go <laughs> to, you're only gonna get what needs to be gotten. And, and that's what the point of this study is. And from the meeting that we had with the, the company, sorry, spaced on their name. That was what they said, they're gonna go in, they're gonna look at every nick and, cr and cranny. Yes, we know we want a new entryway, we want a new cafeteria, but what if there's that thing in the corner that Mrs. Zimmerman was just talking about that nobody has any idea that needs to be fixed, but they're gonna look at that and they're gonna find that and that needs to be fixed. So that needs to be fixed, no field house. Not that we need a new field house, I'm just saying, the, the idea is we need to have somebody look present us with, these are the options, where do you wanna go with them? That is what I understood this feasibility study to be. Then, they have meetings, they make a list of, let's go easy numbers, 10 things really need to get done, have a meeting with the community, the town council, the school board, the community, the community, get some words in, hear what people have to say, and we pick five things. They then take those five things. They start to come up with drawings and plans. Bring it back, what do you guys think? Nope, that's not gonna work. Let's go rework it, bring it back. And, and then we have something that the people have voiced their opinions on. We haven't spent $27 million, we haven't asked for $27 million, but we have a plan that the community said, yes, this entryway, this, that problem in the corner definitely needs to be fixed. Now what are we going to do about it? But we can't get there if we don't get the information. And that's what I thought the whole point of this was. I'm getting some head nods, so I'm not totally off. But so if we wait, as we've heard, from them, the whole timeline. They're gonna get this done so they can start this research while the kids aren't in school over the summer. It moves this up. It doesn't change the timeline. It just makes it so that we can actually make a decision sooner so that our kids aren't benefiting from a safer, better school in seven years that hopefully they can have it in half the time. I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact but it, I remember it being a substantial difference in the timeline if we could get going because of construction windows and alterations and all of that. You know, it, it makes no sense to push just to push because we're going to still have to do it. Councilor Lennon? I'm just going big picture here for a moment. In the end, all we're choosing tonight is whether to send this out to the voters. Okay, this is pure democracy, again. Um, so I'm not sure we need to be so far in the weeds, although I appreciate this discussion. As Caitlin points out, the, we're kind of too late to peel this out because we can't peel out line items. It's against our town charter. So we're just saying we want 250,000 less 
in the school budget. They can do whatever they want with that. They can choose to do the feasibility study and not whatever. So I would just like to make a plea that we continue to remind ourselves that this should be very big picture thinking. And the fundamental question for us tonight is, do we want to take what the school board has created over months and months and months and hundreds of hours and meetings as a presentation of what they believe in their most responsible selves they need for the coming year. And then all we're going to do is pass that along to the voters or not. And I personally believe that this is a particularly opportune year to pass it along to the voters for the following reason. It's a primary year. I think everyone is going to go out to vote. Therefore, I think it's a really valuable test of what our citizens actually want vis-a-vis -vis school funding. Unlike other years where when you only put out the school budget, a very small percentage actually shows up to vote. We're going to hear from the whole town. And frankly, I've talked to a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of people who have said there is no way I'm voting for that budget, and I've talked to a lot of people who said I'm absolutely going to vote for it. I have no idea how this vote's going to come out. But that's not my business. That's not my decision. My only job is to say, it's yours now. Please, everybody, go vote. I don't know what will happen. But for me, personally, I believe my responsibility is to allow the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to vote on the school board budget. And not surprisingly, we've heard that from dozens and dozens and dozens of the communications. And the people who showed up for the public forum and the emails have fundamentally said, please let us vote on this. I believe that they're correct. So to me, this long discussion about that small item is not really particularly relevant tonight. It's do you want to allow the citizens to decide this, or do you think that we should be? I think the citizens should. Okay. Councilor, thank you. Any, Councilor Garvin? Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, start off by agreeing with Councilor Randall that I, I think the increase in expenses um, is reasonable and in line and something that um, I generally support. We've heard a lot of comments from the public. Um, I think that it's possible to think that the 3.1% increase is reasonable while also wanting to find more savings and wanting to find more efficiencies. Um, we've heard from citizens that have talked about maybe ways to save on insurance. We've talked about other regionalization things. We've talked about um, a number of different things that I don't think that we can really impact within this specific budget cycle. Um, so I don't think it needs to be mutually exclusive for you to be supportive of, of continually looking for ways to improve and find more efficiency, um, but also looking at the detail that's gone into the recommended school budget and seeing that um, for the most part, uh, the, the expenses being requested um, are pretty reasonable. Um, I talked about this last year. You know, it, it's even exacerbated this year, obviously, because of the, the um, deficit in state aid. Um, but the, the expenses increasing, um, I, th I think, is, is in line if you look at peer communities. Um, it's actually fairly favorable to some peer, peer communities. We've heard from um, some citizens that have talked about um, uh, staffing and compensation and the number of teachers that we have and the number of professional staff. And you know, one of the things that occurs to me, um, you know, one citizen has remarked about a, a particular physics teacher that's been here for you know more than 20 years and taught his kids and things like that. And, I think about the, the compensation and benefits package that we offer being competitive and that in many towns there's no way that teacher would have been around for 20 years and that we would have been able to retain that good service. And instead, um, you know, we have, we have that as a, a positive story and good, good anecdote to say. Um, you know, obviously the concerning thing is the, is the reduction in revenues and in a town like this where the, you know, principal source of funding is property taxes. There's really nothing else. And even, even though I'm encouraged by the positive momentum um, that's starting to percolate about um, trying to get creative and, and finding you know, other things, 
you know, the stark reality of the fact is that there's not a lot to do. Um, and, um, you know, I, I continue to pledge to work towards that kind of stuff, but um, uh, I think that we also have to be realistic about it too. Um, so lastly, I've made this point a couple of times in meetings that, um, you know, I was really, really um, taken by some comments from Senator Millette when she came to speak to the school board for a meeting that I attended. Because I didn't really know a lot about the EPS formula and how, how it all works. Um, but um, after hearing from her and then doing some more research on my own, um, it is a completely objective and dispassionate view of what uh, the lawmakers in Augusta believe a community should be able to um, should be able to pay for um, supporting its education funding. It's not a group of representatives or senators that sits in some closed room at the state capitol and says, oh, those rich people down in Cape Elizabeth, they can pay more. We'll stick it to them so that we can help out the people in Baldwin. Um, it's, it's not some, you know, scheme by, you know, a, a governor that, you know, uh, wants to stick it to anybody. Um, so this year we have a, you know, we have a smaller pie that we're getting fed from. Uh, with that formula. Um, and that leaves us with a obviously gaping hole in what the state thinks that we should be able to pay. Um, I was taken by your comment, Mr. Thompson, about um, you know the difference between the delta in the um, EPS formula uh, in what, what we pay. I think you said 7,000 or thereabouts above the formula. Um, it's uh, it's long been the, the, I think, the, the goal of this community to have um, exceptional schools, not just average or, or meeting the essential program requirements, but rather um, uh, providing opportunities that create exceptional schools, schools that reach top three in U.S. News, Report, News and World Report and other similar rankings and have um, really high standards for, for where their students go. So, um, you know, I, I think again, I think when you factor all that together, um, the question then just becomes: Is this something that the community wants to continue to support? And the reality in a year like this is that, you know, people are going to have to shoulder more of that responsibility themselves. I'm very mindful of the impact that that has on some members of our community, and um, as. I think many well know um, I and some of the other counselors really championed um, taking small steps to try and help offset that for some of our community members by pushing the um, senior citizen tax relief. Um, you know, as chair last year, I sat here and listened to a lot of people, or we received emails from a lot of people that talked about legitimate hardship that they were going to feel from what last year wasn't nearly the type of increase that we're talking about for this year. Um, so hopefully, there's things like that that can can help strike some accord, some, some kind of balance here. Um, so I think, the, like I said, the question just comes down to, is this something that the, the people of this community are going to say, yes, we, we continue to support this or not? Um, it, uh, it's, it, I, I agree with Councilor Lennon. I've, I've heard from a lot of people that um, I, I don't know how this is going to go. I really don't, and we could find ourselves back here because it gets voted down uh, for the first time in a long time. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but um, this is, I think, a really difficult decision that the community needs to make. And I've, I've tried to paint the picture for you tonight of, of, you know, effectively what the decision is. You could talk about, um, you know, individual light items and things like that, but at the end of the day, um, it comes down to is, is this something that the community will continue to support or not, and I think we'll, I think we'll find that out. I wanted to make, I'm sorry, it was one last point. I know I rambled on for a while. I, I wanted to, um, I didn't get the chance at the last meeting, um, completely separate from all those points I just made, but I see him sitting in the back of the room, Principal Shedd. Um, I was so impressed with your students that got up to speak at the public hearing on May 7th, and I just wanted to make a remark about that. 
Um, there's obviously no greater testimonial for the education that's being provided to these kids than what we saw last week. And the poise and um, uh, articulate nature in which those students delivered um, their remarks really impressed me quite a bit. Um, and regardless of how people decide to vote on that, I think that that should just be acknowledged because uh, I was really impressed by that. Thank you. Anyone else? Does that mean it's my turn? <laughs> Not that what I'm going to say is going to surprise many people, <laughs> but here I go. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I'd like to address the EPS formula first. Um, this has been around, well, it's been enforced since 2006. These fluctuations are nothing new. It's that number that we get has been up and down all over the place. Uh, it is the lowest this year. We are, for the first time, a minimum receiver. And I, I watched, I didn't attend, but I watched the entire video uh, that, that evening that Senator Millette was there. It was, she did an excellent job of describing what happens with that. Um, I'm not aware that any of our elected officials representing Cape Elizabeth have ever submitted legislation to change EPS or to get rid of it, by the way. Um, it happens to be the one redistribution, po redistribution policy that I personally agree with because I, as I've said, I don't know how a child in Madawaska has a chance. And this is, this is the other part of this I you know, want to mention, and that is that the reason we are down and we are now a minimum receiver is, first of all, our property values increase 7%. This, this, the state looks at that as a factor. Our enrollment is declining. People claim it's flat. But 1599 is the prediction for next year. This is what the state predicts. We are currently down 242 students since 2006, when we had a peak of 1847. 1847 minus 1605, which is this year's enrollment, is 242. So it's going down, and the state looks at that. We have fewer special ed kids. We have fewer that are English language learners than, than many districts. We have fewer that get free and reduced lunch as many districts. And we have a, a student-teacher ratio that is smaller than many districts, and they base that on their formula as well. So they also, uh, they also say that uh, Cape Elizabeth, what the state says we need for uh, instruction, this is, this is regular instruction, it's not special ed, is 96.8 uh, instructors. And we have 116.8, this is per the state. So we are 20 over in regular instruction, according to the state of Maine. So, so you know, every year we go through this since 2006 is, you know, the, the awful mean state of Maine, but this formula is in, is in force. There's no sign of it going away. And what I, what I keep asking is that the school department budgets accordingly. I mean, we have dropped revenue sharing and, and we budget accordingly. And I know that's not easy. But we've got to remember, when we tax our citizens, they have no choice. You know, I don't know too many people that are getting a 10.2 increase in their, their salary or their fixed income this year. So we have to remember that. Our folks have absolutely no choice. And with all due respect, Councilor Lennon, I mean, we, and you're right, the stu the, ultimately the voters will decide, but the town charter sets us up as this, as the last stand, so to speak, before that number goes to the voters. So we do have a role in that. You know, we definitely do. Um, you know, having said that, I mean, you know, the 3.1% the increase that's leading to a 10% isn't all that surprising. Um, I do want to point out that, you know, uh, the school board does uh, negotiate with collective bargaining, and so they do control that number, albeit maybe only every two to three years when they renegotiate. I did a little research um, on our percent, uh, our school department's percent salaries and benefits. It's right in our, uh, in our budget packet from them, but we're currently, our school department currently uh, has, well, for fiscal year 19, at the 25, proposed 25 million, 641,000 and change budget, the percent of salaries and benefits will be 83.11%. Our municipal budget percent of salaries and benefits is 51 for fiscal year 19. Yarmouth's 
80% of salary and benefits for their school department for fiscal year 19 will be 81.4%. Their municipal budget is for fiscal year 19, percent of salaries and benefits is, will be 51.6%. Could you repeat the CAPE number again? Yep, CAPE number will be 83.11. That's the percent of their budget which is dedicated to salary and benefits. Our municipal side, it's 51. Scarborough's percent of salary and benefits of their school budget is 74%. Ours is 83.11 for fiscal year 19. Scarborough's will be 74. I couldn't get Cumberland's. They're, you know, they're a school district, and I, after a million phone calls, I stood, still couldn't get that number from anyone. But I'd like to point that out. I mean, and we're very comparable to Scarborough, I'm sorry, to Yarmouth, for example, in size and student population. But over two percentage points, you know, is, that's a lot of money. So, you know, my, this is a concern I have because that, that piece of the school budget has continued to climb and climb and climb. And we are down this year from a peak of 2006, 242 students. So I also would like to address the, the um, proposed um, feasibility study. And I'm, I'm sure my comments won't surprise anyone, but, um, you know, I, I, I like to echo Councilor Randall and Councilor Penny Jordan. I, I have real concerns about that. I've said in several meetings, you know, we had citizen committees in the beginning that developed a plan. We had it with a library. Um, we lost the first library bond. We went back to the drawing board and we spent $75,000 with an engineering company and a citizen committee, and I mean a true citizen committee. We had people from the school board and the town council, but we had others. Um, and we worked for a year to develop a plan. And then we went forward with a proposal. They did the same thing with the transfer station. And so to me, as some have said, this cart is way before the horse. And you know, with comments about, well, the $28 million number or $27 million doesn't really exist, well, here it is. I mean, we were presented this on the 30th of January after a tour of the schools. The figure is $27,425,000, and the purpose of this was ostensibly for, capable, for revitalization of the schools, and apparently they're not pretty enough. Well, you know, maybe they're not, but 27 or 28 million is a lot of money. And I think we need to take a breath. I've, I've asked for a year to, you know, I've asked if they would consider putting this off for a year. Because, and something else occurs to me, I think, and I, I may be incorrect, but I think what is proposed in this that we were given was, and then was presented again recently is essentially almost a 40% increase in building space for the school campus. I think it's a, well, a field house, a facilities building, a brand new cafeteria uh, and kitchen. It may be almost a 40% increase, and I'm very happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. I'm very happy to be corrected. But my point is, this is still an expansion of space, and we have declining enrollment. My other thought is, for $28 million, I mean, maybe we should take a step back and look at all of the town's facilities and buildings to see, okay, where are we going? We are the oldest town in the state. You know, what are we doing for our seniors? I mean, we, we need to accept the demographics. You know, even if we don't like them, we need to accept what the reality is. And so it's another thought I had. So for those reasons that I'm tossing out there, I, 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 would, be, I would be a lot more able to support this budget number if that feasibility uh, money was taken out. I think it's a tremendous amount of money First of all, we don't really know what we're getting. I mean, we, we had this pro uh, presentation in, in January. Uh, very shortly after that, there was a big article in the Courier, which I presume was submitted by the, the school board, which talked about all these things, field house and the big number. And I think we do need to just take a breath and step back and look at all this. I mean, who knows what we'll come up with, but I think you know, a much smaller amount for a feasibility study with, an engine, with engineers and a basically an in writing proposal of we will have a citizen committee, here's the smaller amount, we'll work with the town, you know, go through a whole town process before we come up with something that 
is 27 or 28 million. And look what the needs are. Look at what the needs truly are. I think that safety is critical, and I think the IT piece is critical. I, also, I forget which council mentioned this. Maybe it was you, Valerie. But, you know, that to me is a lot more important or critical than, than some of the other things that are, that are in this document. And so, I, you know, I, I will not be supporting that this because of that number and what I think it leads to. I just have a question. Yep. So for the purposes of tonight, how does that work? Well, if a majority of the counselors were like, yes, I support the whole school budget, I cannot support this feasibility study at this time, is that, are we allowed to alter the number in that way or is that against mm -hmm. our town charter? Uh, maybe I should let the manager respond. Yeah, it's, it's the number, <clears throat> quite frankly, that the council has the, ability, the authority to set. So we could say we, we'll detail. take this minus 249 and put that out to the voters, not, not, not saying this is to strip this out. It would just be like this is the number. Exactly, and then the school board at that point would have to make the decision as to how they felt it was best to spend the funds that were made available by the council. And then I just have one more tiny point, which is people keep saying 10% increase. I know we all understand what you're saying, that it's the increase for the school. But for the purposes of the public, I want to be clear that the number currently before us is actually a 7.4% increase to the taxpayer because the town has offset some of that 10%. It's a 3.1 increase from the schools, which equals a 7.4% increase that you would see if this number went out and you voted yes. I just wanted to clarify that because I think people are leaving here thinking it's a 10% increase. Okay, how's it, Caitlin Jordan? I just want to touch on the, the study again, just while I have the chance to talk about it. We can't just stripe out, strip out the study. We can only strip out the money, and then they can still do the study anyhow. But I still think, even listening to you, I still think you're not understanding what exactly the study is. I mean, you related a lot to the, the library project, and so I was writing the numbers down. For a $4 million library, you spent $75,000 with a firm to come up with what needed to be done. So that at that same ratio, if we spent $250,000 to get a study with an engineering firm, with the architects to figure out what needs to be done with the schools, that would be about a $13 million project. Mm -hmm. So if you guys, and I'm not, throwing the number out there, but if you're saying it's going to be a $28 million project, we're getting a bargain. But I'm not saying it's going to be a $28 million project because I think the, the proposal, and maybe that was the school board's faux pas, is that they put this thing together, it's like, look what we can do, but not really. It's kind of like the $8 million library is sitting in that proposal and we've said, not happening, do the study, which is what you ended up doing with the library for the 75,000 that got you the $4 million library approved. So it's exactly the same process, you're just not seeing it, I don't think, in the right way. They put that big proposal together. They're saying that's not what we're going to do. It's not what's going to come forward. Those are the wish list things, exactly what the wish list things were for the $8 million library. Now they're saying, OK, we need $249,000 and change to do a study like you did with the library for $75,000, put a committee together, got the input, found something that worked, and got it approved for $4 million. That's exactly what the school board's trying to do. $28 million dream list, not going to happen. But we need to hire this firm to come up with a plan, just like you did for the library, to come up with a reasonable project number, just like you did with the library, that the town will vote on, just like you did with the library, so that the community <laughs> can feel comfortable with the project that's moving forward. And they're going to have the same committee that you can, had with the library to get the input from the citizens. I'm just not seeing... I want to make sure you really are seeing that it is exactly the same process as the library, but just for the schools. I'm not sure I got my point across, but I hope I did. <laughs> uh, I, before, I, let me just respond. I think actually it's a, almost an $800,000 study, and of course they have apparently agreed, but that, it, that amount, should they go forward, will be spent. And I just, I just want to make that point. So anyway, right. back back Go over here. Right. So I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know who was first. Right. Councilor right. Penny. Okay. Right. I I I agree with you, Jessica. It's a bigger. This is just an agreement that we will do it for this amount of money. 
Um, but when the bond, see, these are the things, because I agree with you a thousand percent, the positioning, it's like, I think was, it's challenging for the school board at this point in time, and I feel sad for them, because it, it is all these things, all these stories, all this narrative is out there. When what you describe is probably the logical process that will happen, but that's not what people are gonna see. And so what we, I think what we need to do is ensure that we aren't being naive and uh, and just saying, oh, oh yeah, okay. We're saying this is the process that needs to happen, and um, and so it is. It's and it's always with a project like this, any project this size or anything, the positioning is key because the narrative gets out there like that, and then you're doing damage control, and that's what the poor school board is is listening to right now. Is oh. I was just gonna swear. Uh, oh <laughs> darn! <laughs> oh darn! We now have to do damage control because what Caitlin just described is basically what we assume will happen. But Jessica is also right; it's a lot more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Councilor Straw. Uh, just as an initial, I'm really enjoying this debate. So thank you all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hate making decisions. I love discussing things. Um, since we, we did uh, veer into the EPS formula with a couple of the comments, I just did want to touch on a couple aspects of it. Um, technically, we are not yet a minimum receiver, just in case anyone um, is thinking, oh, we are at the end of the road. We're not. Um, Councilor Straw, I was informed by Paula Gadette at the Department of Education that we are currently for fiscal year 19, a minimum receiver. I mean. Uh, all I would note is that I've had to explain. And I, I met with her in Augusta. For, uh, I can't speak to what she says, but I can also tell you that prior to my election, I talked to people at the Department of Education and I had to explain to them the way their mathematical formulas work and the difference between, uh, I, I won't go into it. Anyway, um, but I would simply say that if you look at page 10 of our document, you will see that we are still getting 829, I hate, I apologize, I wasn't gonna read numbers tonight. We are getting $829,643.27. Until that number goes to zero, we are not a minimum receiver. Um, so if anything, you you might enjoy hearing this number, is well, that we have another 829,000 to go. I had to go to 400. So base, I don't wanna give a, a, a um, I apologize, I don't want to go too deep into the EPS formula. Basically, there is the allocation that the state expects from us based on our town valuation. Um, and then um, the amount that they think it should cost for education based on a number of characteristics, really, how many students we have, the administration costs, seniority of the teachers, yada, yada, yada. They take those numbers and they figure out, like, how much is the state going to give you? And right now it's 829. And they do change this every single year. Um, it isn't fixed. One thing that they did recently is they created an additional step afterwards in section five where they gave us an additional 40% adjustment of special ed costs. So what they did is they took that 829 and then they stuck back in another 416,000. So when we hit minimum receiver, what we're gonna do is lose an additional 829, but we'll still get that 416 because that comes after the calculation in section four. Um, and obviously no one other than me really loves this stuff. Um, but there's another 829,000 cut coming down the road unless something else changes. And I just did want to point out that um, actually people are meddling with the EPS formula up in Augusta. And I'll just give you some examples of what they're doing and how it's fundamentally unfair. I do agree that Callis, I do agree that Jackman, they should get more money than us. I totally agree with it. But that doesn't mean that we should get nothing. And here's an example of some of the things that are going on that are not fair as far as I'm concerned. Um, one change that happened this year that pulled approximately $60,000, $70,000 out of the amount that Cape Elizabeth gets is they changed the allocation for system administration from $135 per pupil down to 92. So in other words, Augusta cut the amount we get for administration by $43 a student. The argument in, 
the districts that were in regional service centers got to keep that money. So if you're in an RSU, you kept the full amount. But if you're a standalone municipality, we lost $43 a student. That is not driven by any reasonable, rational thinking, if you think about it from this perspective. Portland is a bigger educational district than any of these RSUs. It is the biggest district that there, there is out there. There is no reason that they should receive a cut to their administrative reimbursement rate simply because they're a standalone district. But that's what is occurring up in Augusta. They're fiddling with these things. Two years ago, uh, they changed the student-teacher ratio at the high school. It went from 15 to 1 to 16 to 1. Uh, that was not driven by any educational policy. That was simply meddling that happened from the administration up there, in my opinion. Uh, Chris, yep. this is complaining about the weather. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I, we've been my, saying this yeah, for 20 I, years. Totally agree. My you point, though, yep, totally agree, Unless totally agree. <laughs> I, which I will never do, <laughs> never do. <laughs> Take that to the bank. Uh, I'm, I'm not, 30 That's months to go. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, no. Uh, long story short, um, it is being meddled with from a political perspective. Um, with the student-teacher ratios, I, I, I basically, I agree with Bill Gross, but I disagree with Bill Gross. Um, and I agree with Councillor Sullivan, Sullivan, but I also disagree with her. Um, the state says we should have 96.8 teachers. Totally agree that is what they say. We have 116.8, totally agree. I have for a long time been saying that we have, we are, our, our headcount is skewed. Um, we though in Cape have never been at a, the exact ratio that is recommended by the state. None of our peer communities have ever, to my knowledge, been at the ratio recommended by the state. That is a minimum baseline. So. I don't agree in any way with going back to 96.8, but I do agree with a slow movement back to our historic level. Our historic level would be around 110. So we're at 116. I completely agree we need to be moving back to about 110. So you're right, we have deviated. This is part of what I have gone into in the past, is that the deviation, though, is not in all the schools. The deviation is in particular schools. And it's part of the frustration when people with younger children at Pond Cove come in and they say, there's no room to cut, there's no room to cut, there's no room to cut. And I completely agree with them. I think Pond Cove is understaffed. Um, the, the staffing is elsewhere. But why are, we, why are we at where we're at? This has happened over the last three or four years, basically when we had the old superintendent leave, and that was basically the time when we needed to make the hard decisions. Mr. Uh, uh, superintendent Coulter came in at basically, I'm gonna come in, this is the way I view it just personally as a parent, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna help for a year, and then prepare you to move on to the next, the new administration. Unfortunately, we weren't able to find a permanent superintendent, so it went on for another year. And in the meantime, we haven't made that hard decision. I wish, it had happened, but I also understand the rationale and the thinking, which this is me assuming, this is me as a parent just looking at it, which is that we have a new superintendent starting in about 46 days. When she comes in, she's going to have her own approaches to education. She's going to have her own approaches to how we should staff. Um, at this point in time, because we are so close to that event, um, the school district has already reduced headcount by two. We are on our way back towards the number we should be at. We've been told that there's a significant number of teachers eligible for retirement who haven't retired. And this goes to your point about the 83.11 versus the 81.4 versus the 74% with the con what, what portion is related to contracts. One of the things I did is I went and I looked at all of the surrounding district's contracts and I did a comparison of their salary matrices against ours. We are not the most expensive salary matrix in the area. What we do have, though, is we are heavily skewed with our teachers higher up on the seniority table. And what that means is that even though our salary matrix is reasonable, because of the fact that our teachers tend to have higher levels of seniority, we end up having to pay more for salary. Uh, finally, and I'm going to wrap up this part, um, the feasibility study in the citizen committee. I would just note that a citizen committee doesn't make sense to me here with 
uh, at least with respect to Pond Cove and the cafetorium and the middle school entrance, because those are utilitarian driven designs and from my perspective. I don't see how much the citizens can offer in the way of input as to the number of square feet are needed for uh, a dining area for children, uh, exits in like food preparation. So that aspect seems more utilitarian. The other aspects make sense to me, and I, I hear you on that, but it's at least for the components mm -hmm. that I actually think we should be going forward with. Not so much in the square footage. The facilities building is, I view that as more a one town concept as opposed to school specific. Uh, so the facilities building, when you're talking about the square footage increase, I would pull that out. Um, I'm not mm -hmm. going to quibble with your calculation if it's included, mm -hmm. but I personally yeah. would not include that as a school object. If I may, Councilor yeah. Lennon, just before I call on you, I just wanted to say to Councilor Straw um, that, um, and I just lost what I was going to say. <laughs> Um, what was your last point? Seniority. Uh, no, it'll come to me. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I had something that I needed to add, but go right ahead, uh, Sarah. I'm sorry. Just lost that. Brain so, cramp. <laughs> in the interest of moving along, <laughs> my favorite thing to do, <laughs> given that these poor people have been now sitting here for almost three hours. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like we have a choice. We can either vote right now on what's before us um, in our packet and what's been moved and see if we get a majority or not. Um, or we can take out this 249 because it seems to be highly contentious and wrestle with that in another way going forward, revise the number and vote on that. And I guess my question is, what do counselors want to do? Because we could literally sit here till midnight having a conversation. It's fascinating, but we need to keep going. We have like a whole council meeting after we finish this. Yeah. So that's my feeling, and I don't. I. I can we take the temperature without like voting? Well, no. We could certainly make a motion. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a motion. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. We have to oh, vote on the I have motion. motion and seconded for the full amount. Mm -hmm. So okay. we could vote on that. If it goes yep. down, we could, I don't know. Yep. We can certainly do I that. I think Jamie wanted to say something. I'm sorry. I just wanted, Council Garvin. I wanted to amplify the point on the square footage just because I, I, I respect and appreciate the point you're trying to make. I, I think for the purpose of, um, you know, uh, the public consideration that uh, the vast majority of the square footage we're talking about adding mm -hmm is not, it's not like we're adding classrooms. It's not like, you know, so I agree. What Chris said, you're, you're talking about a brand new building for facilities that has zero student facing impact necessarily. You're talking about taking one very large space that's shared by two schools, the current cafetorium, that has dual purposes to be cafeteria and auditorium. And by, by the nature of accepting that as a need, you're automatically increasing by 100% the amount of size mm -hmm. and square footage because you're saying this space that used to be used for two things can only be is now only going to be used for one and we're adding a complementary space so and then with the entryway that's the the third largest you know so we've all agreed i think that there's concern about you know the security and the access and stuff like that well to, to solve that problem there's a significant amount of square footage added to the the front fascia of that portion of the building. So I think it's it's slightly out of context to say a 40% increase in space with, you know, people will disagree about what metric you use for flat or declining enrollment when it's it's what that space is um, that I think deserves more context. I just didn't want to leave that lingering yep. there, so. Sure, and thank you. You know, I think the other piece of, of this that I was trying to make is that when you're looking at a figure like $28 million in a small town with significantly declining enrollment that maybe you need to step back and say, what are we, what are we doing with, you know, with all these spaces in town and, you know, do we, should we be looking at some reconfiguration, you know, and just you better, using in a better way what we have, something like that. That, that's, that's really my point. But anyway, so let's, let's one real quick proceed thing. on. Yeah. <laughs> To what you just said, that's yeah. exactly what the feasibility study is supposed to be doing, is to look at the schools and see if a reconfiguration for your yeah. very vastly declining enrollment that you say is happening. That's exactly the point. Take a look at the schools. What are some solutions that can be worked on? But okay. Thank you. I'm done.
Well, I think, are we, uh, we ready to vote then? I, I just do feel compelled to point out that the enrollment is not dropping over the last period of time. It's, yes, if you look back to 2007, 2008, but that was a peak. You can look at economic cycles, you can look at the recession, you can look at the effect on fertility rates. There, yes, we dropped from then, but if you look at the last few years, the enrollment is not dropping, it is growing. Councilor Straw. The enrollment in 2014 was 1675. The enrollment in 2015 was 1647. The enrollment in 2006, uh, I'm sorry, 16 was, uh, I'm sorry. The enrollment in 2016 was 1633. The enrollment last year was 1603. The enrollment this year is 1605. Those numbers are all declining. So uh, I you, no, they're not. You just went 1603, 1605. Oh, I'm sorry. And there was well, an expectation okay. we were going to be at 1570. So we're running 30 ahead of what we expected. The kindergarten class right now, I'm anticipating is between about 110, 115, okay. as opposed to the 80 something we had this last year. So we're, we we experienced the drop from the recession, and we're beginning to surge back up. Well, in my me... opinion. But again, we're just reading tea leaves. So. Yeah, well, I, I disagree yep. respectfully, Fair and I, I'm sorry for my yep. blooper reading the wrong year. This <laughs> okay. 1605 to 1603, yes, yep. Yep. but but nevertheless, these are the actuals, and so I just want to point out this is what has actually been happening. So enough on that, I think. Anything else before we 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 vote? Okay, so would the motion? Would you please repeat the motion that we have on the table? It's for the full amount, I think. It is for the full yep. amount. Um, that was the first um, motion by Councilor Caitlin Jordan for the twenty-five million six forty-one two seventy-six. Then there was an amended motion that passed to include under item number seventy-two one through eight. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is actually uh, approving the original motion as amended. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. All right. It, it fails. Okay. Is anyone prepared to make a new motion? Council Lennon. Hmm. I should have thought about that for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we um, that the council, I move that the council vote on items one through eight as set forth in our packet um, under item, I'm sorry, under item number 72 2008, um, one through eight, with a total of, I'm taking out 249, so 25, 641, 276. Minus two. I just asked the town manager to. <laughs> 149,000. That would be uh, 25,392,276. I'm sorry, can you read that again? 25,392. 25,392,276. 276 with a grand total of 25,392,276 which if anyone's really brilliant at math, would, would <laughs> put forth to the citizens a tax increase of. You're challenging me. <laughs> Council Lennon, if you give me just a half a second or two, I can get that for you. I knew we had one brilliant person at the table. <laughs> or, or one good spreadsheet. No, and I'm dying. I think I do. I'll go yeah, I, I oh, yes. Right uh, take, take it's, it's in your performance. Yeah. 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 Six Is it empty? Yeah. Okay. I hope so. Yeah. We have three people racing for it. <laughs> it's already yeah. done, Matt. Already yeah. Yeah. Used to us. We, oh. we have some performers yeah, that have, have that scenario. Oh, yeah. Tell me it just was looking for that because we have some. This? Do you have the 249? I only have the 250. Yeah. Uh, minus 250. This is 250. Yeah, we, we can make we can make it 250. That's very close. Yeah. We can make it 250. That would put it at 250. Yeah. Okay. So you would like to know what the net effect would be? Approximately 1%. It would be uh, on the school side. The net to taxes would be 9.6% change. 
on the tax rate would be 8.9 percent, and then the total would be 6.6 percent. So you'd be, you'd be dropping from 7.4 to 6.6. So and that's eight with this exact number you gave me. So just to reiterate, my um, my motion is item 72 dash 2018 uh, <coughs> items uh, one through eight um, minus. 250,000, which gives us a grand total of 25,392,276, or a 6.6 .6 total tax increase to the citizens. Before there's a second, uh, out of curiosity, you're taking an extra 650, an extra $650 more than the feasibility study. Oh. So I, I know it gives a nice rounder number I for I the performance. Yeah. No, but the second time you had 250, I believe. The math so for this number was 249. I think they roughed out the 6.6 yeah, yeah, with the, 250. I know, I'm just saying, but I, I thought what you just said, maybe I jumped the gun thinking, but I thought what you just said to clarify my motion, you oh, said no, I minus repeated. 250. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. minus 249. But so the minus number 249 was exactly. Three. Counselors, could you just hang on a second and let the manager address yeah, this? The number that we would use would be 25392276 which was the amount that, that she has stated. That, that, that's where I, I took it more importantly on that side of it. Okay. Which was 249. 249. Yeah. Yeah. So he was using 250 to get this 6.6. .6. I just wanted to make sure, because it's a number. Like, that that's clear? the number. That's so the when number. we go to, right. like, if we that's leave here, number. even making a $600 mistake is, okay. that's the number that's, you know, I just want to make sure. So again, that is the cost that the school board asked for for the feasibility study, but they are under no obligation by law to get rid of that. So we're mm -hmm. just, so everyone knows that. It's, it's the implication, but we don't have any jurisdiction over that. Second. Thank you. Through the, okay. Any more discussion? Oh. Councilor Garvin. Um, I want to talk about the feasibility study because I didn't do that in my first remarks. Um, I fully support the need of the, um, many of the improvements um, that have been recommended for the schools. Um, I've been at all of the workshops, took the tour, I've been in the schools as a parent. Um, I think the need is real. I want to clarify why I voted against the first motion um, and why I'll support this. I actually believe that this money shouldn't be coming as part of the school budget. Um, I think it should be part of the municipal budget. Um, these are school buildings. These are, uh, town, I beg your pardon, these are town buildings, um, town assets. And I think that as part of a more comprehensive planning process, we should be looking at, um, as even as Jessica said, how do we look at our total footprint, our total campus, our total town um, municipal need, and um, ad address things in a more comprehensive manner. Um, so I don't want my vote against the previous motion to be perceived as a vote against moving forward with these. I would be very hopeful that we can engage in a dialogue that looks at um, you know, potentially different ways to approach this going forward. I've had some conversations with Matt, as well as the finance director, uh, uh, finance committee chair from the school board, um, about um, you know different ways to structure um, some of these accounts going forward. I think it's worthwhile to look at as we as we consider things that are more blue sky thinking and um, new approaches to old problems. Um, I think this is something that we should really take a look at. So um, while I didn't favor it as part of the, the school budget, I do favor us going forward and trying to find this money somewhere else. Hopefully it may be even further reduced cost, I don't know, um, but I think it's something that the town should, should share in the burden of. Councilor Straw. Uh, so I just want to uh, echo what Councilor Caitlin Jordan had said earlier, and this is my concern, is that we don't have any ability to tell the uh, school board this 249 is coming out of the feasibility study. Uh, that's my big concern. Um, it's the reason why I voted the way that I did. Um, I'll be really upset if there are any cuts at Pond Cove or the middle school. Um, when there are things like an athletic trainer at the high school that I don't think should be in our budget. The budget, however, reflects, it is a policy choice. It's a, it, it does not reflect my educational, um, my approach to education, but at the same time, it also doesn't reflect the approach to education of any of the individual school members. It's a collective decision they all reached and said this is our educational policy. Uh, so, 
And I realize that our position here is not to be choosing our educational policies, but I re my, my big, we don't have line item authority. We don't have line item authority, and that's, that's, my, that's my issue. And I'm concerned about that. Uh, Councilor Randall. Um, I just wanted to follow Councilor Straw's comments previously about how um, he and we failed in this process a little bit. Um, I would like to see the schools get everything that they need and um, I think that the requests that have been made are entirely reasonable um, and I echo Councilor Garvin's sentiment that this is really something that the town should be addressing. So um, I apologize for not being more involved in the process and I'm prepared to be much more involved in the process moving forward. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. I, I was shocked by Jamie's comments and agree <laughs> with them. <laughs> I, I kind of like the idea that, you know, if we're going to take this on, then let's take this on. Um, my only concern is the budget goes into effect July 1, correct? Make sure I got all my facts straight. So we're hoping to have a big budget meeting in June, right? We want to, our next agenda item is to talk about a joint workshop with the school board. I'd like to get that done as soon as possible because the reality is I'd like to have had a couple meetings to talk about this so that we can decide, is this something that a train that the town council is about to get on and start driving. <laughs> you knew I had to go there, come on. Um, and, then, and then that would give the school board some enlightenment as to where they should cut that $250,000 from before July 1 when they need to know, right? Because we're just setting a number and, and they wouldn't necessarily need to cut something from somewhere else in order to move forward with the feasibility study or to cut the feasibility study and keep the other stuff. So while well, I still don't support cutting it at all, if it's going to pass, having it cut, I'd like to see all these meetings happen and let's get some direction so the school board knows that if we're not going to approve this number to allow for a feasibility study, then that's because we're now going to take it on and it's going to become a municipal budget problem. And we're going to look at it, but also I think the whole one town concept, I don't believe in the two budgets. But I think that needs to be a clear direction so they know where they should be cutting this money from. Because I'd hate to see them cut from somewhere else to move this feasibility study along just for us to decide a month later, well, we think we should do our own feasibility study and they, you know, the, everybody gets what I'm saying? Yes. Sorry, it's getting mm -hmm. late. Also, Lennon? Clarify, 249, not 250. I know, I'm sorry. I was just rounding numbers up. <laughs> and just very quickly, we're not taking this on, okay? We're not grabbing this out of the hands of the school board. It's, 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 I agree with you, it should be one town, I, we all want to meet, please let's stop using the language that now we're going to take this over, we're not. Um, it's going to be a, a collaborative process, but it is focused on the school buildings and now. I think that's what Caitlin meant. I think, yeah, that's I misspoke, I'm sorry, but I 100% You guys are making it sound like, oh, it's big, our no, no, now, but, but we don't want it. We. For those that believe in the one versus the other, the big they, it's big. They, they, the big. they seem to want to think it's we. moving the to one, but w. I think we need to have these meetings and get the one town concept and, you know, a, a better budget system overall. So we that, need to vote you know, people keep saying we rubber stamp, we rubber stamp, but this is the first year, and I want to accredit Matt to coming up with, we need to start next month with a whole new process of how these budgets are handled. And I think it's the first year in a long time where we have a plan moving forward about how to fix the budget process. And I'm really looking forward to it. Any, anything no. else? Councilor Lennon? No, I want to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw you do this, so I thought, anyway. So, are we ready? Okay. Did we ever get a second? Sorry. Uh, I, yes, no, I don't know. Second. 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 We have a motion. I, I guess. That. Yeah. I. I think I'm gonna. I think I should say something. I. I'm. I'm glad that we've taken this this amount out, um, and and we're we're doing this basically making a statement and saying, gee, you know, this is not where we should be going. I have 
I'd have huge reservations also with the rest of the, the, the school budget. I, I, one of the concerns I have about the health insurance um, situation is that I do believe that um, there, and maybe they get this information. I mean, we, we have to, we have to pay our, our claims, of, of course. But I think that we can find out that information, and I hope that they can try to do this sooner, because I think you can get that monthly. Maybe I'm wrong from MEA, but monthly or at least quarterly. So in other words, if there is an uptrend, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be an $800,000 shock out of nowhere. And so that, that was the impression I got, and I, I don't think that it had, I think that you can follow your trends with your claims history so, and, and plan for it as much as possible. That's, that's a concern I have. Um, so anyway, I, um, you know, I, 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 I think I'll probably support this going forward with, with big reservations, but for some, of, for some of those reasons. I do think that um, I wanted to, I remember what I meant to say to you, Councilor Straw, about the uh, feasibility. When a citizen committee is critical for a couple of reasons, when you, you engage an engineering company with a fee for that, as we did with the library, as, as we did with the transfer station, because it is, it's those experts that say you need X amount of space for code, for national, whatever. We had that with the transfer station and also with the library. You know, they said, well, this, these are the ADA things you need in this type of public facility or with the transfer station. These are the constraints you have with this type of equipment or whatever. So that's where you get that information. You don't rely on citizens, but citizens learn about this. And then when you have true citizens involved, then you, you, know, you tend to get better buy-in throughout the community because people of all kinds, including seniors, can say, well, yeah, okay, that's really important. That's what we need. So that's why you know, a citizen committee, in my opinion, is so, is so critical. So, without well, going any further. No, don't need I just want to make a short point. We have to vote point. before 10, or we have Technically to vote on voting. Technically, we just have to introduce it before 10. But. Yeah. I just, okay. I just yeah. want 30 seconds. Uh, please, no one construe this as us in any way voting against the schools in any way, shape, or form. This was a really, really, really difficult decision. I agonized in problem. I was on the fence whether to support the feasibility study. My big concern is the fact we don't have light item authority. Everyone up here, I am sh I'm really impressed at how hard we've all worked on this, the amount of effort we put in, and I'm really happy with the deliberation we've gone through. All right. Thank you. So would you, would the town clerk please read the motion on the table? We have a motion and a second on item number 72 to approve numbers one through eight with a total of 25392276 which equates to a 6.6% .6 overall tax increase. Okay. And is there a second? There, there was a, a second. A motion okay. and a second, yes. All right. All those in favor? Opposed? All right. Now, in order to proceed past 10 o'clock, I need a motion. Uh, Council Garvin? I move that we suspend the rules so that we can continue with the agenda past the 10 o'clock hour. Is there a second? We need a second to keep going. Oh, second. Council Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? All those in favor? No, I'm discussing. Okay. No. <laughs> now she wants to. I'd like to suggest that we have before us literally a whole nother council meeting. I myself don't feel at my freshest right now, having already had ten, three hours of meetings. I think we should finish the budget portion, but I would like to suggest that perhaps we um, put the rest of this off to either our next meeting or we hold another meeting to review it. I think these all merit discussion and it could take another two hours. Okay. I, I myself don't want to be here till midnight. Uh, Councilor Garvin. I think we have to finish the budget stuff in order to have that it be on the, on, uh, that the, agree. Um, on the ballot so, um, and, and be within the, the time okay. of that. So um, I, I appreciate um, the late hour. I, I would just say maybe if we can push through to mm -hmm. 1030 or so, I, I think get as much done as we can to leave as little as possible for the next month. That's my opinion. I would agree, um, and the other the other thing is many of the items here are going to workshop, so I, I don't think it's going to go, I think we can keep going, and if it looks like we're getting into trouble, could we revisit at that point? Okay, maybe we can um, 
be mindful that we're sending it to workshop and we don't need extensive discussions on each one before we send it to workshop, which we love to do sometimes. Right, right, no, I think everybody is on board with that concept. <laughs> okay, so uh, all those in favor of suspending the rules to proceed? It's unit, Councillor Caitlin Jordan, did, did you? Yes, okay, I've thank you. Up and down. To okay, trade. item number 73, approval of the Cumberland County Assessment. So moved. Second. That was fast. A second. <laughs> yeah. Any discussion? Begrudgingly. Pardon? Just said begrudgingly. I know. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we really have no choice, actually. <laughs> All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 74, approval of local homestead exemption funds. The Cape Elizabeth Town County, I should read this out, held up, having held a public hearing on May 7, 2018, does hereby approve for inclusion in the fiscal year 2019 budget the amount of $300,000 for the local share of homestead exemptions. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 75, property tax levy limit. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council, in accordance with Title 30A MRSA Section 5721A, the Town of Cape Elizabeth hereby increases the property tax, tax levy limit for municipal services to $7,456,365. So moved. Second. Well, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, okay, and or item number 76, the proposed fiscal year 2019 general fund budget summary motion, and I do believe that number has just changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has. Uh, if you would be so kind as to uh, de uh, to change the number under school department to 25392276. Mm-hmm. Did everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, under the net amount on net taxes under the school department, that number would change to 23623299. And then the total would change to 32651906, which is just below that just revised number. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, on the tax rates on the school side, that number would change from 1403 to 1388. And the estimated total would be from 1933 changed to 1988. Okay. Wait, went up? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. Down. Oh, sorry, 18. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 1918? I, I, I transposed <laughs> like, the, the box above it. Yes, I apologize. That would be 1918. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Very good year. And so <laughs> the bottom number. Yep, the bottom number will be 1918. The bottom number 1.7 is still unchanged. That will change when we go to commitment. So, okay. And the uh, the percentages all would flow uh, would have those differences as well. But the the key numbers would be the ones that that we had there. Okay. Any questions? Any discussion? All those in favor? I don't know if I ever said yeah, I don't so. Think moved. You have a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. So moved as adjusted. Pardon? So moved as adjusted. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, item number, was that, that was yep. 76, and then we jumped to item number 76, discussion. 86. 86. I'm sorry, 86, discussion of citizens' concerns relating to the management of the school department. And um, oh my God. so I'll, let me address this. I was the one that asked that this be on our agenda tonight, and so I'd like to explain. Oh, I'm sorry, public, public comment. comment. I'm sorry. Would anyone like to speak to this item? <laughs> Did you ask if there's any more water down there? Sure. I think it's okay. I'm uh, Tom Dunn. I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lake. And I attended last week's um, discussion at the, at the uh, school board. And I was, as a citizen in this town, we've owned property here, lived here for um, over 40 years. Uh, Due to my business, I have been in front of uh, planning boards and town councils and listened to the dialogues. I was totally underwhelmed by <clears throat> the behavior of your school board members. And I thought David Plimpton's <clears throat> response, and I'll just 
use a couple of his words, was very apropos, and I think uh, the board should apologize for their behavior, in my opinion, the, the school board. Um, <clears throat> David's comments were, um, uh, the board members were, had displayed incivility, de de wait a second. <laughs> defensiveness and anger, as well as demissive, arrogant, rude, combative, and personal ta attacks aimed at the person who recently raised the questions. And <clears throat> I was there, and I just could not believe it, because we're <clears throat> all in this community, we're all citizens, and you got to always treat people with respect. And I did not see it that evening, and I'm, I'm very disappointed, and I think a, a, an apology is, uh, uh, would be certainly apropos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Point of order. Obviously, my wife's on the school board, so raise it in case anyone has an issue. So. I'm sorry, what, Chris? Obviously, my wife is a member of the school board, so yeah. I will raise it again just as a point of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim Thompson, Six Pine Ridge Road. I wasn't going to get up again tonight, but I didn't. I do think uh, you guys made a giant step forward with uh, the consul the uh, concession, I guess, that you made on the on the two hundred forty nine thousand. I think it's going to make it a lot easier. It's still not going to be easy, but it's going to make it easier to get that that uh, budget increase passed. So I think. Um, I was, I was thinking it was going to be a unanimous, and, and they're always easier to put, push forward when you can say the town council unanimously voted on this uh, budget. It would have been a lot easier than if it would have been a 4-3 kind of a vote. So I think that's going to give us some ammunition when, when we do get confronted with, with people. It, it still is a six point something, which is higher than we've had since I think maybe seven or eight years. But a big step forward. Another, another roadblock I think you could get out of the way of getting this budget approved, because there is quite a bit of buzz in town about what, uh, I, I think there was a planned workshop for you to get together to go through this, uh, this item, and it's been put off. Uh, I do think if you met and kind of worked through that, it sounds like, uh, based on what the CPA that was here tonight going through, part of it was a, a computer issue. Part of it was a learning process by our business manager. Some of those issues. Um, so there may not be that much more for you to work through in a workshop. And if you could get that out of the way and kind of uh, dispel some of those concerns that are kind of buzzing around town, I think it would be another way to help us get this budget approved. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this item? I'm sorry, what? Okay. Uh, 86. No, item number 86. Um, just briefly, I think that uh, regarding the system, citizen memorandum that came to the town council with regard to mostly school board issues. Um, you've received a written copy of a response from the school board approximately a week ago. Uh, to date, since we've sent that uh, to you and to the uh, citizen, we've received no comments, no questions from anyone. It was over a week ago. So I just want to be aware that it's like, as, as far as we're concerned, there's no questions outstanding regarding it. Has there been none posed to us after a week of our response? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, anyone else? I'm Janet Villiati from 7 Montgomery Terrace. And I was the citizen, as you all know, <clears throat> who was addressed at the school board meeting last week. And I would just like to say that the manner in which I was addressed publicly and on camera would not warrant me feeling comfortable to respond to the email that I received. I'm sorry that you missed Mr. Dunham's comments prior.
Anyone else? All right, thank you. So anyhow, <clears throat> so as I was starting to say. Are you gonna go first? Uh, well, I, I wanted to explain why I asked. Okay, go this, ahead. Yep, I thought that I should, why I, I just thought this ought to be on the agenda. So I wrote some thoughts down, so please bear with me. I put this item on tonight's agenda because I'm very concerned about citizen engagement and transparency and process. It's critical that we respond to citizens' concerns and requests and that we do so expeditiously and with respect. At our April 9 town council meeting, a citizen addressed the town council with concerns about school board management, administration, and the municipal audit report, citing significant deficiencies. This citizen asked that it, the town council hold a joint board workshop with the school board so that these questions could be addressed in public. Since April 10, there have been, which was the next morning, there have been several attempts by the town manager and myself to schedule such a meeting, Unsuc unsuccessful attempts. So I put this item on the agenda to have some dialogue with the council about this issue. I'd like to know if the council, or I'd like to ask the council to discuss whether we should vote as a council to formally ask the school board to hold this joint board workshop to address these concerns, which was what was requested of us by the citizen. It's true that the majority of, of her concerns are out of our purview, and I, I stated this on the 9th, but some of them are within our purview. The municipal audit results are most definitely within our purview, and I think it is very unfortunate that the meeting has not taken place. I think it would have done a great deal to uh, allay concerns about issues and any credibility. But my overarching, my overarching issue is how we encourage citizen engagement and how we treat people when they come with us, before us with questions and requests. And we need to make sure that we honor these requests and that we treat people with respect. And that is my concern. And my requests were dismissed as, well, your individual request has no standing with us. So that is why I've come to the council as a whole, to ask the council to discuss the issue. And again, my, my goal is to ask the council, what do you think about having a joint board meeting with the school board on this? And would you consider formally requesting that meeting? To have it. I also think if the council thinks about this, that I, I think it might be important to have that meeting before June 12. And the reason I say that is that I think this, this needs to come to us while we have the current superintendent in, in his job, because there's going to be a change. And we have heard from citizens that are very concerned that, that this meeting take place before they can feel they can vote on June 12 because of the concerns they have, all the overriding concerns that we've, like great deal that we've already discussed tonight. So again, my, a citizen came to us and requested of us that we ask, we hold this meeting, we ask this meeting. I think that, I think that we should. And I think it would allow the school board to publicly answer things they have sent an email, but this, which is good, but this is not what was requested. And so that, that's what I just want to put before everybody and have a discussion about it. So, Councilor Penny Jordan. Okay. Um, number one, yes, I do agree with the joint meeting. But here's where I come at it. I look at the, um, the uh, communication that uh, Janet did as the opportunity to bring us together. I, I feel this divisiveness happening and it, it really makes me uh, sad and uncomfortable because what's been created as, is an opportunity for collaboration versus finger pointing. So if we all come to the table and we start looking at it as the opportunity to come together as school board and council to start addressing a different way of operating, to 
start really looking at how do we get outside this box. Um, I, when I saw this item on the agenda, I didn't disagree with it in concept, I disagreed with it in words, mm -hmm. because it was finger pointing. It's saying, you aren't managing. Well, what, what we need to do is say, thank you, Janet, for that, that, that communication, that uh, research that you did, because you know what you did? You spawned for us a dialogue between two entities that has needed to happen for the last, I'm going to say, 10 years. So I look forward to working with the school board and to move away from us, you, them, they, and say, how are we going to do all this together uh, because it's a huge problem to solve and we own it, all of us. And um, so do I agree with joint meeting? Yes, but it's not going to be an us, them, they, you did, blah, blah, because Janet does us a favor. I'm going to say it again. Bring us together, help us start working through problems together. Councilor, oh, I Lennon was first, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of joint meetings. I'll have as many as people want. I think it's awesome. We're going to start with the um, proposed renovations. I personally do not think that um, Janet's email should be um, the impetus for one for several reasons. Number one, I don't think that the tone or the content of her um, letter to us was in any way in any way could be construed as collaborative or a favor or bringing us together. I thought it was highly, highly accusatory, um, strident, um, and highly politicized. And I think it only got, got grabbed and made more politicized. I mean, the fact that it was in the Portland Press Herald, that it was, in my opinion, um, very unfortunately posted on our website, which has never happened with a citizen email before, that our town staff spent time emailing it to other people. Unprecedented. And my question is, first of all, we've addressed everything that we're allowed to address already many times. We've had a full workshop with the auditors already. We've gotten answers. We've had her back tonight to circle back and get more answers. What more vetting is there? We, there's no more questions to answer. The rest of the, her, her, I don't even know what to call it. For me, they were accusations, but let's say points, had to do with personnel issues that are confidential. We can't, we can't have a public hearing about Kelly Hassan or why she was chose to leave or was asked to leave and how much she got paid. We can't have that discussion. So it's, it's not only is it not in our purview and has nothing to do with the council, it's illegal to talk about it. So I don't see what we would discuss in this workshop. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're setting a precedent that we can't possibly meet. So are we saying from now on, if any citizen wants to email us and say, hey, I want you guys to have uh, a meeting with the police station, with the school board, with, you know, with Bob Malley's department, and here are my list of 20 complaints, and I want you to go over them all. Who gets to decide that we're going to meet based on this one and we're not going to meet based on that one? I've never before seen a citizen email requesting meetings by elected officials that then was granted. I've never seen it. So sure, we can do this, but beware that it's setting a precedent that we then must honor. Because are we going to get to be the people that choose which email generates a meeting and which doesn't? I think that's a dangerous road to go down. So on every level, I think this is highly ill-advised. If, if Ms. Valenti wants to continue to pursue this with the school board, I would encourage them to. I think it's totally on their purview if they feel they've answered it. I don't know what they want to do about it. I don't think we should get involved. I think it has nothing to do with us. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. I think you, uh, respectfully, I think you missed Penny's point that she wrote this report and it's all those things that you just said, but that's not what we're gonna go have the meeting to talk about. That, we're gonna take that and be like, you know what? It's probably a good idea that we have a meeting, and I've said it several times throughout tonight that we should have joint meetings to talk about how we're going to do the budget process going forward, how we can avoid getting memos like this, how we can work together. That's what we need to have a joint workshop about. And the fact that people keep complaining that we haven't had a joint workshop with them and they gave it to us a month ago, I, 
if they denied to meet with us, I'd hate to tell you, but I really don't think we would have been able to schedule it with all these budget meetings going, uh, and I've had it by now. I'm not saying that they didn't deny the request to meet, but I'm just saying the reality of actually having gotten a meeting within a one month time frame was, is not a reality. I also truly feel that they, we got it, then they got it. They needed to have a school board meeting to discuss it before they had a meeting with us, which they just had this meeting to respond to her. What the back and forth about, we're not meeting with you, I'm not pervy to those because I wasn't included on those requests. But I do think we need to move forward with the meeting, with the school board, and I hope they'll accept, not just about finger pointing, like some people want to do, but more like what Penny and I are saying. Let's come together. Let's figure out a way to move forward in the one town concept so that we can stop being us and them. It's, this is what needs to happen if our community is going to heal, I guess you could say, and, and move forward for the next few years so that we're not sitting here every budget year having the same conversation. I really want to see new processes, new policies put in place so that we can approach this in a, a much better fashion. This isn't working. Can I just quickly respond to that? That's not what's on our agenda. Exactly, but that's it's what Penny that's said. What I said. We're, we're, then, then we can't. This motion then, hasn't been then made. Then at a later date, we need to decide to have a meeting with them, but we can't. We're, this motion hasn't been made. All it, all it's okay. been, all we're doing is okay. talking about it. it, it right this, now, that, if I was to make a motion, I'd say that yeah. we should meet with the school board Related and a joint to the management workshop. of the school. No, board. that's not make. We, no, we can't meet about this that. is just because it's on the agenda. Okay. I'm pretty sure I pointed out several months ago. Got in a lot Ca of trouble. Councilors, just because it's on the agenda through, doesn't mean that's Councilor what Councilor Kaylin Jordan to say. and Sir Councilor Sarlana, please through the chair so we don't go Wait, so go off I the would reservation. Like to make a motion because there isn't one. Correct. Pardon? There isn't a motion right now. Uh, I don't believe you so. You introduced no. it, Penny talked, everyone talked, so a motion that the town council and the school board have a joint workshop to work on budgetary processes, town, one town concepts, how to collectively collaborate, collaborate together on making our town better. So those better words? Seconded. Discussion? Councilor Randall? My, my point goes a little bit to the previous discussion, but I didn't get in before yeah. the motion and it's <laughs> the, relevant to this as yeah. well. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, in response to Councillor Lennon's comments that this may have been politicized and publicized more than uh, another email or a number of other emails, um, but the reality is that it, it did go to that place and it um, a lot of people are aware of this and I think a lot of citizens are concerned about this. And I think it's important for us as a council to address citizen con concerns and I especially think it's important um, given the upcoming vote on the school budget that we address the concerns prior to that because um, having supported the budget that we did, I would love to see that budget passed and I would hate to see for people not to vote for it because they feel that they haven't been heard or that um, that the response um, hasn't, hasn't adequately addressed their concerns. Um, and I also wanna make sure that when something is, um, does become very political and, and publicized that we make sure that we're responding appropriately in general um, because we always want citizens to feel comfortable coming forward with these issues. We don't want anyone's voices to feel stifled because maybe um, the response that they got either wasn't adequate or um, as Ms. Filiotti, um indicated that she felt um, uncomfortable in the response, that it made her feel uncomfortable. So I think a priority for us should be to make sure that citizens don't feel like they can't speak out because they aren't going to be um, treated respectfully. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Garvin. Um, I I appreciate the motion that's on the floor, but I, th I think we should keep this um, specifically focused to the question at hand. I, th I think and I hope that we're going to be having a lot of meetings with the school board in the near future around a number of different topics, but I don't think that the um, substance of this matter should sort of get um, inappropriately brushed aside or swept away um, in the midst of all that discussion. Um, I reached out to Chairman Sullivan the other day. Um, 
I, I wanted to be very clear when I saw this on the agenda, what exactly were we hoping the outcome to be? Um, as has been brought up a few times, you know, there's, there, there's not a specific amount of jurisdiction that we have in this matter. It's not like we can, well, frankly, we can't even compel the school board to meet with us, um, right. let alone in that meeting, um, you know, admonish them or tell them what to do or things like that. Um, and it was made clear to me that I, I think the desired outcome is simply um, to make sure that um, somebody who's raised some concerns, A, feels like they have adequately been heard, and B, um, you know, hopefully is provided with uh, all of the information and answers um, that they're seeking. Um, you know, I, I, one of my um, sort of core principles for being, you know, serving on the council has been, um, you know, oftentimes when people have a concern, they, they just want to be heard. They, they want to be appropriately heard to feel like they've, um, you know, you've empathized with their concern. They might not like the answer that you give them, um, but at the very least, you can say you gave them, you know, a fair opportunity to be heard. Um, I, I think, you know, are we going above and beyond to, to provide that opportunity? Maybe, but I'd, I'd rather err on that side than, than not at all, number one. Um, and number two, I, I think that good, bad, or otherwise, this has become a matter of, um, you know, sort of the need to rebuild trust. I, I, I don't think that the school board has necessarily done anything wrong. I think we've had the auditor here tonight. We've sort of worked through a lot of those things. Um, you know, I'm hopeful um, that this can just put this to bed. Um, but I think that the longer we drag this out and the longer that we just sort of let this fester, then it's going to leave lingering questions for people and it's going to, you know, it's going to sow seeds of doubt where they don't need to be. So um, I just as soon try and, you know, wrap this up and put it aside. And, you know, I'll, I'll just echo that as well. I mean, I, I would like to see us hold this meeting and, and have the school board address the things that they can address. And as I say before, as I said before, there are some things that, again, are not our purview. Um, I want to, um, I just, uh, for Councilor Jordan, who may not have seen the emails, but when a request was made to have a meeting to discuss safety items uh, uh, on, for April 30th, uh, that meeting we attended with the engineers were here again uh, on April 30th, I, I requested that uh, the Viliati documents could be addressed at that meeting, and that was rejected. So, you know, I have made attempts to meetings that were able to be created. Um, my request was rejected. And then I have the email string, if anyone wants to see it. So I think it's, you know, if we can just go ahead and ask, they may refuse, but I think a citizen has come forward to us, and I think, you know, we should, we should honor that request. And I would also like to reiterate that um, it is important that we treat our citizens with respect, even when they're asking questions that we don't want to hear or that we don't want to answer or that we don't like. And we've, we certainly have all been in that position, but I think we have to work extra hard to make sure that all of our citizens feel that anything that they're worried about is going to be uh, dealt with. And so I'm, I'm hoping Council will support that. Councilor Straw is next. Uh, just as a procedural matter, it would seem right to me that this item was never voted on in any way, shape, or form by the town council to send it to workshop or discussion with the school board. So from that perspective, um, it was simply introduced or mentioned at a meeting, but we took no action. So I actually do agree there shouldn't be a workshop until us as a majority say there should be. Well, that, uh, so I just that's the intent of this. Oh, item. I know, I know. But with respect to your request prior, um, just because well, we hadn't acted as a collective body. So, um, and with respect to the pending motion, um, I don't see any reason why we can't council vote yes yeah. on the pending motion, mm -hmm. um, and then also have another motion with respect to everything else that was brought up. I, I would like to point out yep. as a point of, of information, yeah. neither did the council decide to act on whether they should meet again with the school board to review engineering safety concerns. Mm -hmm. That, so I mean, you know, all right. Uh, uh, I'm I, sorry, I just, who was next? I, just want, <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to correct you on that though, because the school board voted to have a workshop of their own. They invited us to yeah. come, yeah. but they were gonna have that workshop regardless whether we attended or not. Yep. That wasn't a joint, I mean, that. It, it, we, there was not a, a cooperatively chaired meeting or any, I mean, that was a school okay, board yep, workshop yep, that point we taken. happened to go to mm -hmm. attend. So, yep, point taken. And frankly, 
I, I, and I've made this point to you, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll reemphasize it. I made a comment in a meeting <laughs> where we were reviewing, you know, items related to this. Mm -hmm. I said, "Geez, I, I really think we should talk about this more." I, I think I, I don't like the impression being left that, well, one one thing was accelerated over another. Um, so I, I think that that's. Okay. You know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But. Thank you. I'm not sure who was next. I'm just going to clarify a quick thing. I have no point to make. The motion that's currently on the floor has nothing to do with what people appear to be desiring. So I, I, I don't I think agree. we should vote twice. The, the mm -hmm. Kumbaya meeting, we can do any time we don't need to vote on it. I think we should cancel that out and address what's actually on the thing because I hear people saying they want to do it. I don't, so I think we need to vote. So the let's get together and be one town concept and collaborate, I'm totally on board with. That's not what's on our agenda. So I think we need to scrap that motion and make the real motion about the Violetti email. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, would you read the motion? Is it just, was it seconded? It was. Okay. Would you be willing to amend your original motion? I, I will, but after I make a comment. Okay. I just want to point out the timeline. We received this memo on April 9th. The school board had a meeting on April 10th, but per transparency and such, they could not discuss this memo at that meeting because they didn't give proper notice. We then had workshops and presentations, and they didn't have another meeting until just this month, last week, where they were able to address it. So I think it would have been completely inappropriate for the school board to show up to the April 30th workshop where we were invited to discuss something that they hadn't had a chance to even discuss among themselves. So I just want to point out the timeline of why things might not have worked out as picture perfect as people would have wanted them to. To amend my emotion, I guess, it depends on what everybody wants. I want the Kumbaya meeting, but if everybody wants to have a little vet out of what they were able to discuss at their meeting and, and they kind of present it to us, then that's another request than the finger pointing. It's just like, can you come, it's kind of like what we do with all of the other committees and stuff. They write reports and then we ask them to come to a workshop and present what they figured out. If that's what we're asking the school board, hey, could you just come walk us through these answers? That's different than finger pointing to me. So I'm totally for amending my motion to invite the school board to maybe come and walk through the report that they already prepared. Uh, if I may, I, that's the intent. And so that we, we have a venue for that to take place. And that's, I personally don't see any finger pointing. I think that this is just a public venue as requested. And, and I certainly think it would be a very good idea to do this and help clear the air publicly. So, so therefore, would you be amend willing to change your a moment? Uh, yep, amend it so that we ask the school board if they will come mm -hmm. and present their answers that they presented to Miss. Sorry, I had no idea how to pronounce Violetti. it. Violetti. Violetti. Okay. Sorry. And do I need a second on that? Council Straw had originally. <coughs> Would you second that, Councilor Straw? I haven't seconded the amendment yet, but I seconded the original. Thank you. All right, so well, honestly, I can't remember what we need to do next. <laughs> you need, you need, a second. Someone needs need a second. I need a second on the amended motion. Councilor Brent Jordan, any more discussion? <laughs> so all those in favor? Of the amendment. Of the, of the, amend of the amended motion. Of the amendment. Of the amendment, of the amendment. Yeah. yes. Thank oh, you, I'm sorry. So unanimous, thank you. Okay. Next item. No, now that we get a vote on it. Can I say something first? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I am more than willing to support the meeting as long as the tone of the meeting mm -hmm. is about understanding and moving forward. Because yes, I want, I want to hear what citizens have to say, but what I don't want to get into is us versus them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's got to be, we're, we want to understand, let's work together. So I'm more than willing to support it, but I'm going to ask that if I hear you or us, or then I'm going to have to just go, okay, um, I, I don't want to be in a divisive meeting. I just don't think it's healthy for us as a town. 
think probably everyone would agree with that, myself included. So where are we procedurally? Yeah, we need to vote. vote on the amendment. Yeah. On the amendment. Okay. On the motion, on the as original amended. motion, as amended. As amended. On the original motion as amended, which would be to ask the school board to meet with us prior to June 12 to present mm -hmm. their answers in a very respectful and cordial way. As well exactly. as work on new budgetary yeah. processes and policies and how no, to move forward. Right. No. That's no. already in there. It's, it's, it's already in the motion. No, That's it's a new amendment. Uh, it's just no, on the I added, sorry, through the chair, I added okay. to the motion. Yeah. I did not right. take out. That's I, correct. I want the kumbaya okay. meeting okay. as well as okay. make you guys yeah. happy with the presentation I'm meeting. About that. I've asked the town clerk to go to go over it. So if we can, again, please through the chair, because we waste time when we get into all these sideline conversations. As, Cowler, Kay, as Councilor Caitlin Jordan po pointed out, there was an addition to the original amendment to ask the school board to present their answers to the Janet Biliotti memo. What you're, and that was voted on. Now you're going to be voting on the original motion as amended, which would include a discussion of budgetary processes, the one town concept, and collaborative efforts on making the town better. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Four, no, five, five, two? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have to say opposed. Pardon? Opposed. And opposed, right. And I don't, I don't even have jet lag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's past 10.30 to I, I, have, again. I have other jet lag, actually. <laughs> okay, item number 87, in by the sea licenses. Um, this is their annual license approval, and I'll ask the town clerk if she has information about that application. Uh, this is a renewal by the Inn by the Sea for the Malt, Spiritus, and Vinous Liquor License and Special Amusement Permit. Uh, we have run the application by police, fire, and code enforcement, and no concerns uh, reporting, uh, no concerns have been reported relating to these applications. So the proposed motion would be to approve as presented. Okay, is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan? I just have to disclose that my family business does business with the by the Sea. Thank you. Does any councilor have a concern? No? Great. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Was there? Oh, Councilor Randall? Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's approved. Okay. And now item number 88. Uh, the Spurwink School Reuse Committee recommendation, and I would like to give Councilor Garvin the opportunity to tee this up, and I suspect we're going to workshop, but nevertheless. I'll be very brief given the hour, <laughs> but um, uh, yes, so uh, you're all in receipt of um, the report that was uh, unan unanimously recommended by the members of the um, Spurwink School Reuse Committee. I see John Volts here, um, Caitlin Jordan as well. Uh, we appreciated the contributions of Heather Altenberg and Jim Walsh as well. Jim Rowe, thank you for waiting all this out as well. I know you have a, a obviously vested interest in this. So um, it is my recommendation that we refer um, this matter to uh, workshop for further discussion and detailed presentation by the committee. Great, thank you. And certainly like to thank the committee for all their work. Is there a motion? Councilor Garvin? I move that we refer this to future workshop. Mm -hmm. And a second? Second. second. I'm not sure who was first, actually. It doesn't matter. Just, okay, just, put, just put Jordan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Item number 89, naming of new private drive Waltman Way. And um, I will ask the town manager to address this item. And I know the police chief is here. On, Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to address this briefly. Uh, what we have here is a, is a request to drive, uh, name a new private driveway, which is a, a new location at the end, uh, or actually an existing location, at the end of Running Tide Lane, that uh, if, if the town was to put a new number on that lot specifically, it would have to change pretty much an inconvenience just about every resident who lives on Running Tide uh, Way by having to renumber uh, their houses. Uh, going back and forth. So what part of the solution was, and the, if the chief would like to speak to this as well, was to come up with a private drive and then what you need to have is a new name for that drive. 
uh, the name Waltman Way was brought forward by the applicant. Uh, it was checked by the chief as well as the assessor for any conflicts. There are no conflicts that have been found in that, so that's why uh, the request has been brought forward this evening uh, to have that name. And the council is the only has the powers to make that approval. Okay. Is that pretty much it, Neil? Perfect. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> um, item number 90, request for a zone change to business zone A at 560 Shore Road relating to used car sales. And the recommendation is to... Point of uh, order. Go to a public hearing. But I live right down the street. Um, and okay. know basically everyone in the neighborhood. So, and friends with the butters and whatnot, so. Okay. I'd like the town manager to tee this up, please. I'd be happy to, Madam Chairman. Uh, as, as, <clears throat> excuse me, as the council may recall, uh, approximately, uh, well, back in, in back in February, the town council re received a request from the owners of this property to have uh, a zoning change made with the, amending the business A zone to allow uh, used car sales, uh, and then. Uh, because they have, the, well, they've sold cars off their lot for a long time, uh, but they wanted to make sure they could do it legally. They have dealer plates, uh, but the zone doesn't have it as legally permissible land use. Uh, so what that did was uh, refer that to the planning board for them to consider uh, changes to the ordinance. They came back with uh, a couple of different changes here. One was under definitions. Uh, the second one, the more important one in this case, was uh, in the Shore Road Business A District, a repair garage may include up to three vehicles at any time for sale, which coincidentally enough is the level uh, to which their license with the dealer plate allows them to sell cars at. Um, they also have restrictions as far as uh, signage that would take place as far as being able to identify cars for sale. Uh, the, the planning board received this request, held a public hearing on it, uh, received very little pushback, and came back with a 7-0 recommendation to the council to, uh, to for their consider for your consideration. Uh, the recommended motion at this point would be to send it to a public hearing next month for the for the public to come back in and have another opportunity to weigh in on it. And at that point, if the council so chose to uh, to make the amendment to the ordinance, and then it would take effect 30 days later. Can I? Can I, um, I just want to disclose that that's my sister's signature on this document. Planning Board Chairman Jordan? Yeah, <laughs> so I just, and, and I don't know from this point forward, I mean, when things come from the Planning Board, I think I'd probably need to say my sister's my ch uh, is the chair, okay. Thank you. I think Councilor Kaylin Jordan was next. Uh, I just had a procedural question so that we're not setting a precedent, but is it common for us to not send this to ordinance? Like, are we skipping a step? Because it's an ordinance change. So I just, have we done that in the past where we get an ordinance change and it not go to ordinance and go straight to a public hearing? I just, I don't want us to have never have done that and now we do it and then something yeah. else comes up and we're like, well, you did it that one time before. That, that's my only concern. I think the, mo the most recent example would be when, uh, if you may recall, the the property director directly across the street took the same procedure uh, when they did their when they did their change. It went through the planning board process and then came back to the council. Okay, so which, it's, I, it's fine. Which property? Um, the, the property that's called Tara. 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 Yeah. 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 So, so that's the, that was the process that that undertook. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? Uh, the, it's a real quick question. Oh, sorry. Is it going to a public hearing because it is um, a zoning change that's so required? Yes, it's it's required for the council to act. So the council, the, the, the public actually has a couple different yeah. opportunities to bite at the same apple, but they have the, the public hearing level at the planning board level, and then and, yeah. and then it comes back to the council as when you do any type of ordinance change, yeah. uh, the council yeah, has, yeah. must hold a public hearing. Okay, so my second question is, after the public hearing, I assume we're allowed to send it to ordinance should we wish it tweaked after mm -hmm. we hear from what people have to say. It's that we're not precluded from sending it. Right, you're not no, precluded. We're just taking this step first. Yeah, oh. yeah. And the council, you know, the recommendation at that point could be that you could you could act on it that evening. Send you it could to send it to ordinance committee or you could uh, send it to, you so know, maybe a future workshop. It would be workshop. helpful actually to hear first. What yeah, no, that's why I was just yeah. wanted to make sure, you know, we have a lot of things happen. I can't remember. Yeah. We've done it before. All right. Councilor Garvin. I move that we refer this matter to public hearing on Monday, June 11th. Thank you. Is second. there a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. 
Okay, item number 91, a report from the Fort Williams Park Committee relating to commercial van, bus, and vehicle traffic at Fort Williams Park. Um, we just got that today. Yes. And, um, and the thought is to send this to a workshop as well, if you'd like to address that also. Sure, I'd be happy to, um, Madam Chair. This is the report that uh, everyone has been waiting for, for recommendations on, on commercial traffic at the fort. Uh, they, have, they have recently uh, completed it and they brought forward the recommendations. Uh, so at this point in time, the, the recommendation would, would be to uh, receive the report and refer it to a future workshop with the, with the Fort Williams Park Committee. And I, uh, we got it today. I didn't get a chance to finish reading it, but I certainly will and will be very pleased to look at what this subcommittee has come up with. Looks like they've put quite a lot into it. Um, is there a motion? To, this is Council Caitlin Jordan, a second? Second. Councilor Randall, uh, any more discussion? All those in favor of thanking the subcommittee, <laughs> receiving the report, and sending it to workshop? <laughs> Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Item number 92, the Harbors Committee report. Uh, and uh, let me uh, ask uh, our counselor who is on the Harbors Committee if she would like to introduce that item. I can. We thank you for the extension. It's finally complete. There's um, lots of work went into this report. A, a lot of it took us in a lot of different directions than I think we originally thought when we set out on this, but I think it's a very comprehensive um, accounting of what's going on for you know, the waters, access, harbors, you know, all of those different things. And we still have the, um, the marine report has been sent to the comprehensive plan committee for their undertaking as well to do with what they wish. All right, thank you again. Uh, we're happy to receive it, and there's a lot of work is put into this. Um, is there a motion? Maybe so would you would like to make one? Yep, and a second it. <laughs> second. And any more discussion on sending the Harbors Committee report to workshop? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number three, uh, 93, group use request for Fort Williams Park. Camp Sunshine wants to come on Thursday, August 23rd this summer. Uh, I'd like to ask the town manager to introduce this item. I'd be happy to, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a re request for August 23rd, as stated, uh, for uh, a, grouping, uh, uh, a group who's affiliated with Camp Sunshine. They're planning on having an event that's, I believe, beginning up in, uh, up in Harpswell. Uh, with the, you have six Navy SEALs who have volunteered to, uh, to perform a fundraiser uh, in order to raise funds for Camp Sunshine. Uh, they're looking to swim, I think, from Harpswell to Freeport in the ocean, get on bicycles, ride to Crescent Beach, get off their bicycles, and then run from Crescent Beach to Fort Williams with the finish line at Fort Williams. So there's six, six I'd say, fairly robust fellows who are planning on doing this. Uh, well, there's a reason why they're SEALs. Are you <laughs> but, uh, participating? Uh, negative on that one, Councilor Jordan. How, uh, how much are they going to make it paid? Well, it's, it's, let's it's just say it's a significant fundraiser for, the, uh, for Camp Sunshine, which is a camp that is, uh, you know, specializes in providing uh, recreation for kids who have terminal illnesses and their families to come up. And it's, uh, it's located in, on Sebago Lake. Uh, and they do great, great things up there. It allows the whole family and, uh, and, the, and the child to come up and they, they get to spend some time at the camp and do things that, quite frankly, they don't get the chance to do. And there's a, a number of doctors who volunteer their time to take care of the kids and uh, also support the family. So uh, this is part of a multi-phase, obviously. Uh, the fourth phase would be they're going to end up at Black Point Inn for, uh, for dinner that evening, which is the culmination of their fundraising. But. Uh, and, and as, as I say, full disclosure, the, their director of development is a friend of mine, so I've, I've volunteered for them on a couple different times uh, in the past. So, uh, but, it's, uh, but they had made the request, Fort Williams Park Committee received it, recommended that they, uh, they have a half day use area fee and pay $500. And uh, you know, they're probably gonna be there for a couple hours. They're probably talking about 200 people more or less uh, coming there. Uh, and then they'll, they'll be there, the guys will, cross the finish line and then they'll, they'll leave shortly thereafter. And the Fort Williams Park Committee has voted, you know, six zero to approve this and they send it up to us. Uh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan. I just had a question about the history of 
waiving the fees. I mean, if ever there was, you know, a good organization that, you know, is doing a fundraiser that the town would consider waiving the fee of using the green, what is the, I'm sure there's a policy, what is the policy on doing such a thing? Uh, uh, Kathy's here. Did they discuss that at all at the park committee level about waiving the fee? So they wanted to make sure they treated similar charities equally. But that's what I was wondering. Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Sounds the one in. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. And our final item, number 94, um, <clears throat> we have uh, received the 2018 Board and Committee goals from the Fort Williams Park Committee and the Thomas More Library Committee. I know that weather, I think, was an issue as to why we're, weather this winter, why we're getting these a little later than we thought we'd be, so I'll let the town manager tell us about that. Yep, uh, you are right on, right on the mark, Madam Chairman. The, uh, both committees had, had scheduled meetings in March to go over their goals for the year, and as luck would have it, uh, they had them scheduled on, let's say, foul weather evenings, so they could not get their meetings together. They met in April and approved their uh, their goals for the year, and so that's why they're brought forward on tonight's agenda. All right, thank you. Um, is there a motion to acknowledge receipt of the Fort Williams Park Committee and the Thomas Memorial Library Committee's 2018 goals and objectives? So moved. Thank you, Caitlin Jordan. Is there a second? Sarah Lennon. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any, uh, well, there is one citizen. Uh, would anyone like to raise or uh, speak to the council before we adjourn the meeting that is not, has not been on tonight's agenda? No, nope, seeing no one, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion Councilor adjourn. Garvin, second? Second. All right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. <laughs>